the solar is uh, highly uh, uh, unstable uh, during some range of moment and in, in, in different activities leading to a unstable solar. And there are various dynamic and static stabilizing structure that will help to contain the solar in its normal position. Of the most important static st stabilizer is the labrum, the joint capsule, glenohumeral ligaments, and the negative joint pressure. And of the dynamic structures, the most important is the rotor cuff group of muscles. There are scapulothoracic group of muscle. The neuromuscular coordination and proprioception helps to contain the shoulder in its natural position. So labrum, uh, as we all know, it increases the depth of the glenoid socket and increases the contact surface area, thereby being an important stabilizer to the shoulder joint. And there are uh, different uh, lig uh, capsular ligament structure, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the middle gl glenohumeral ligament, the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. These all helps to stabilize the shoulder in various range of movement. The superior helps usually in a normal adapted uh, neutral abduction position. It prevents inferior translation. Middle gl glenohumeral ligament has an important role in the mid range of movement, especially at 45 degree of abduction with some degree of extension and external rotation. The most important of all these is the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex, which is often compared to a hammock. And it has two bands, the anterior band, the posterior band, and the inferior pouch. The anterior band tightens up in abduction and external rotation position, and the posterior band tightens up in the position of abduction and internal rotation. And they help to stabilize the shoulder by preventing the inferior subluxation as well as uh, the anterior and posterior translation. The long head of biceps also has some role in stability by acting as a depressor. No, 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 no. And the, there is uh, something called a rotator interval, uh, which is the space between the uh, bounded superiorly by the supraspinatus, inferiorly by the subscapularis, and medially by the coracoid. And this interval con 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 contains the capsular humeral, uh, coracohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament, and the biceps tendon, long head of biceps tendon. And sometimes the laxity in this interval will result in, in some laxation, and it is a major pathological contributor in some cases of multidirectional instability. And the dynamic stabilizer, as we know, the rotor group of muscle will always try to compress and centralize the humeral head over the glenoid socket throughout the range of movement, especially in the mid range. So if you take a closer look, it is a complete complex interaction between this capsular ligamentous structure, labrum, and the dynamic stabilizers, which helps to contain the shoulder joint in its anatomical position in varying degree of range. The negative intraarticular pressure and the concavity compression effects are the main stabilizer of the shoulder in the mid range of movement. And the capsular ligamentous structure usually tightens up and acts as a major stabilizer in the in range of movement. So coming to shoulder instability, instability means inability to maintain the humeral head over the glenoid fossa throughout the range of movement. Instability is not equivalent to joint laxity. Joint laxity is a physiological condition where there is incomplete loss of glenohumeral articulation and it is not associated with pain. Subluxation is a partial loss of glenohumeral articulation with symptoms. And dislocation is a complete loss of glenohumeral articulation. And we'll mainly focus on dislocation talk today. So any pathological process that compromises the stabilizing mechanism of the shoulder will lead to shoulder instability. Knowing the pathophysiology and etiology will help in determining the risk of recurrence and ultimately guides the management. So there is something called anatomical injury concept, which was given by Warren back in 1984, uh, though uh, the newer concept has come in the shoulder instability, but it is one of the oldest concepts. <laughs> He says that the instability will result from combination of four types of lesion. Either there's lab labral ablation, that is Bancart lesion or its variant. There is plastic deformity of the capsule. Either there is lesion by distension or elongation in the rotator interval, or there is humeral or glenoid bony defects. And he says that for a dislocation to occur, the lesion must be produced at least in two opposite pole of the joint. So there is something called a mid-range instability uh, when the shoulder is in the mid-arc of motion, and there is in-range instability. This mid-range instability is mainly due to insufficiency of the concavity compression effect. That may be due to a glenoid defect or due to a muscle imbalance, or because of inability to maintain a negative intraarticular pressure that may be due to a lax and thin capsule, especially in MDIs, multi-directional instability. 
In inference of instability is caused by failure of anterior inferior capsular tightness, mainly the Bancart lesion and its variant, and the engaging l sacs lesion. We will come on detail of each pathological lesion now in coming slides. The shoulder instability accounts for around 50% of all dislocations in the body. Its incidence is 2% in general population and 1.7% among the adults. Trauma accounts for 95% of the cases, and it is three times more common in male. And most of the time, the shoulder dislocation in 90, up to 95% case, it is anterior direction. There are various classification system developed uh, to address the shoulder instability, but one of the uh, good one, and that uh, addresses both the pathophysiology and the etiology is a Stanmore classification. It is categorized in polar type one, polar type two, and polar type three. The polar type three, the muscle patterning pattern, muscle patterning type is relatively a newer concept. It is because of the imbalance of especially the superficial group of muscle, the latissimus dorsi, the pectoralis major, and the uh, weakness of the rotator cuff group of muscles. And in polar type one, mainly the lesion is traumatic and we get most of the time the shoulder dislocation is due to trauma causing a structural damage in the shoulder. And it may be microtraumatic or atraumatic with some minimum structural damage then it is a polar type two. And the muscle patterning type do not have any structural damage, but because of the imbalance of this muscle, the shoulder often gets dislocated. And if we, we should know the etiological cause of the shoulder instability to address the address for the treatment. And there is classification by Matson, which uh, we were reading for quite a long time, that uh, is a macro traumatic, micro traumatic, and atraumatic. And there is some overlap over this etiology. This macro traumatic type are usually treated by. Uh, requires a band card surgery, so they are called tops. And the, the atraumatic are usually due to uh, rotator interval uh, laxity and the capsular laxity, and usually are treated by rehabilitation and sometimes by inferior capsular shift. And there is a simple, simple classification according to anatomy by the direction. It may be anterior uh, instability, posterior, or multidirectional. According to etiology, it may be tops or atraumatic. According to a clinical course, it may be acute dislocation or a recurrent dislocation. And according to the degree of instability, it may be a subluxation or a dislocation. Mm -hmm. So coming to a few pathological lesions associated with the shoulder instability, enter shoulder instability. The most important and the most common is the Bancart lesion. It is nothing but a torn anterior inferior glenoid labrum when the humeral head comes out in an anterior direction. And it is present in up to 97% case of acute first time traumatic dislocation. We should take in mind that you, uh, with you, whenever there is shoulder dislocates by a, a good amount of trauma, there is always a chance that the Bencart pathology has already occurred and it will be subsequently leading to the recurrent instability. And uh, we can see the arthroscopic picture of the Bencart region down on the below. There is a uh, labrum is detached from the anterior glenoid margin. And there are various labral pathologies with various terminologies associated with uh, in the Entry solar instability, it may be a band cart, soft tissue band cart, or a bony band cart. If it is associated with a posterior solar dislocation, there may be reverse band cart. There are certain fancy terms like parthes lesion, reverse parthes lesion, anterior labroperistial sleeve apples and ellipsa, the posterior labroperistial sleeve collapsa, ellipsa. There is only labral stripping is there, the ligamentous stripping is there without stripping of the labral tissue. There may be glenoid labrum articular cartilage detachment, glenoid articular rim defect. There may be glenoid avulsion of glenohumeral avulsion of glenoid, glenoid avulsion of glenohumeral ligament or humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament, or it may be a bony haggle. And there is sometimes called a double lesion. Usually the parthesis is called a double lesion and ellipsa is also called as a triple lesion. So this Arthroscopic pictures with the Bancart lesion, usually in acute dislocation, the, uh, the labral tissue pathology is uh, relatively fresh, repairable, and a good quality tissue, and the repair will help. In a chronic Bancart lesion, the labral tissue is scarred, uh, fibrotic, and the mobilization become difficult, and the repair may fail. And after a good uh, repair of the Bancart lesion, usually the instability part goes off if there are no other offending pathologies. And if coming to bony band cut, in 20 to, 22 to 50% of the recurrent instability, there is bony band cut. And it may be a small flake avulsion or a significant bone piece. And it should be addressed 
while doing the repair. We incorporate the bony fragment. We can, in acute dislocation, we can do primary repair. And there may be combined lesion of the glenoid lab from there may be osseous, combination of osseous pathology, labral pathology, as well as the distended capsule. Coming to a brief introduction on band cartridge and its variant, as we know, if it is with a piece of bone from the glenoid margin, then it is an osseous band cartridge, which may be repairable. And the name Parthes lesion. In Parthes lesion, it is a variant of a band cartridge in which the labral tissue is detached from the glenoid margin, but the periosteal sleeve is in continuity with the uh, scapular part. So there is a, uh, the labrum is not floating. It is just adjacent to the margin. And if the labral tissue get detached and it migrates medially and inferiorly, then, and usually heals over that side with the fibrous tissue, then that is a absalism. Anterior labroperiosteal sleeve avulsion. And there will be sometime detachment of the glenoid labrum, uh, glenoid uh, cartilage, articular cartilage at the margin, just adjacent to the uh, labral tissue. Then that is called a glad lesion. So, what is the significance of elapsa? Elapsa is usually associated with higher number of preoperative solar dislocation, usually signifies there is a larger hill sex lesion and a larger amount of glenoid bone loss. So presence of elapsa itself means there is a high risk of repair failure and recurrence rate is twice as compared to band cut repair. So there was an article published in 1999 explaining about this double, triple and quadruple lesion, not so quite popular, but it shows the how the etiological, how the pathology goes on on the uh, glenoid margin on the labral tissue. It starts simply most of the time with a simple band cut lesion. Then it may be, as we talked, the Parthes lesion, which is called a double lesion, or it may be a triple lesion, which is an alpha. And sometimes the pathological change occurs within the alpha lesion, then that is called a quadruple lesion. Similarly, there may be a damage to the inferior glenohumeral complex, and the different terms are given, like humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament, haggle. If it is associated with the bony piece, then it is called bony haggle. Sometimes the inferior glenohumeral ligament may be detached from the glenoid side, then it is called a gaggle. And there may be sometimes a posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament may be detached. Then that is called reverse haggle or haggle. And sometimes there may be just a floating inferior glenohumeral ligament. And sometimes even there may be a tear in a inferior axillary pouch. So these are the some labral and uh, ligamentous pathology occurring with the anterior shoulder dislocation. This MRI picture shows the humeral levels of the glenohumeral ligament, and its incidence is around 2.8 to 9.3 percent in solar dislocation. And failure to identify it uh, preoperatively or in, during surgery might be a cause of recurrence. And it is sometimes difficult to arthroscopically address the Hagel lesion, and you may have to go for an open repair. And this picture, MRI picture, shows the bony avulsion, bony Hagel, and the reverse Hagel. The other soft tissue injuries that occur during the solar dislocation may be a slap tear, superior labral anterior posterior tear. It is associated in up to 22% of the anterior solar instability. Slap itself doesn't cause instability, but it adds up on the solar instability and causes persistent solar pain. So coming now to the bony part, the bony defects, the glenoid defect. Whenever there will be a glenoid defect, there will be the loss of glenoid concavity as well as the glenoid arc will be reduced, and that will predispose to the recurrent shoulder dislocation. Why glenoid bone loss is important is that if we only address the soft tissue pathology, like a, do a band cut arthroscopic repair, without addressing this bony defect, if they are of significant size, the risk of recurrence is up to 67%, and that is 16 times more. So the pathology of the glenoid bone loss will be progressively increasing with increasing frequency of the dislocation. So it is better to treat in an earlier phase so as to uh, avoid the uh, maximum damage to the glenoid cavity or max significant bone loss. The type of bone loss in a glenoid may be uh, in acute small chips of bone from the glenoid margin may be avulsed. And if there is recurrence, then it may go into partial attrition or complete attritional tear of the uh, damage of the glenoid. And higher is the damage, it requires a uh, larger, uh, bigger surgeries with bone grafts and the risk of failure and risk of recurrence is high. 
So what is the critical bone loss in a glenoid? Glenoid is often compared with a pure shape. The ETOE did a study on a cadaveric model and find that the defect which are less than 21%, if the only soft tissue stabilization is done, then it is adequate. But if the glenoid bone loss is more than 25% or the glenoid is inverted pure shape, then the surgical outcome is poor with soft tissue repair. But there are other studies which shows that a lesser amount of bone loss from the glenoid is also significant. And one study shows that if the glenoid bone loss is 17.3%, it is critical. And it leads in recurrent dislocation after arthroscopic Bengard repair, so should be addressed. And some studies show even lesser amount. The glenoid bone loss of only just 13.5% is also critical. Though it is not associated with high recurrence, but the outcomes are poorer if the pathology is not addressed. So there are different treatment modalities developed based on the glenoid bone loss. Uh, they, so they try to address if the bone loss is more than 15% in some studies. Coming to humeral head side defect, whenever the shoulder dislocates anteriorly, the posterior superior margin of the humeral head impacts against the anterior inferior margin of the glenoid cavity and causes impaction fracture and which is called as Ilsax lesion. Ilsax lesion is present in up to 80% of the initial dislocation and up to 100% cases of the recurrent dislocation. And the size of glenoid lesion, uh, Ilsax lesion can be determined by various methods, which is out of the top for this topic. And it is often classified as engaging Ilsax and non-engaging Ilsax, which we will talk on the subsequent talk, um, slides. So there are different classification system of Ilsax lesion. Uh, most commonly used uh, is the calendar, calendra classification. That is either uh, the hill sex is confined only to the articular cartilage, it extends to the subchondral bone or to a large subchondral defect, and it is by direct visualization. And other way is uh, if the defect is less than 20% or 20 to 40% or more than 40%, uh, based on that, it, less than 20% bone loss, uh, hill sex lesion size is said to be clinically insignificant, but the concept is changing. It mainly depends whether the hillsax engages or not, depending upon the location of the hillsax. So if there is hillsax lesion as well as the uh, glenoid bone defect, then it is called a bipolar lesion. And it is present in four out of five cases of anterior solar recurrent instability. And depending upon these bone losses, various treatment modality has been designed. Uh, what surgery is uh, going to address those pathologies? Mm -hmm. And the newer concept, uh, not so new, but uh, in 2012, the Yamamoto gives the Yamamoto and Itoe give the concept of the glenoid tract. They try to identify what size of the Hillsax lesion is actually critical and causes recurrent dislocation. And they do they did a study on a cadaveric 3D CT scan, and they told the glenoid tract is the area of the glenoid on the humeral head in a physiological range of moment, and as the arms move into an athletic position that is in a 60 degree of glenohumeral in abduction, the glenoid tracks migrates from inferior medial to the superior lateral aspect of the humeral head. And the part of the uh, humeral head that comes in contact with the glenoid during this arc of motion uh, will determine whether the Hillsax lesion will engage or not engage and will cause dislocation. And it is said in a normal shoulder, this is, the glenoid track is the 83% of the glenoid width. But if there is a glenoid bone loss, then the glenoid tract decreases and uh, the smaller amount of Hillsax lesion may become significant, causing dislocation. location. There is something called Hillsax index, which is the measurement of the width of the Hillsax lesion plus the bony bridge between the rotator cuff footprint and the lateral aspect of the Hillsax. And the uh, summation of the width of the Hillsax plus bony bridge is called Hillsax index. And if the Hillsax index is less than the glenoid track, then that is on track lesion. Usually, if the Hillsax index is more than the glenoid track, it is often off track lesion. So, what is this on track and off track lesion? If during the in range of movement, the glenoid, the Hillsax lesion is covered entirely by the glenoid, and if it doesn't come in contact with the margin of the glenoid, then it will not cause dislocation. Then that is a non-engaging Hillsax. If the Hillsax lesion comes in contact with the glenoid margin and causes dislocation during in range of moment, usually, then that is a off track or engaging Hillsax. 
so there are few pictures that will show why this uh, why and how this ill sacs and the glenoid defect will uh, cause a dislocation uh, in different uh, range of movement of the shoulder the glenoid defect mainly causes a mid range instability of a shoulder because in the mid range the anterior capsule is lax and it doesn't hold the humerus humeral head in place so the head head comes out of the glenoid socket because of the defect in a glenoid but during in range of movement the the anterior capsular structure tightens and despite there is a glenoid defect if we do a soft uh, and the size is less if we do a bancard repair then there is a tightening of the uh, anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament complex and it will pre uh, prevent the shoulder from dislocation in in range of movement Hill sacs lesion doesn't cause a mid range instability. And if the Hill sacs lesion is contained within the glenoid during the in range, then the, uh, the his shoulder is still stable. But if the Hill sacs is not covered entirely by the glenoid at the in range of movement, then it engages to the glenoid margin and the shoulder dislocates. So if there is a Hill sacs lesion associated with the uh, glenoid defect, the ill sacs being of same size, which was initially covered by the whole glenoid, normal, becomes now an unstable glenoid, uh, unstable shoulder. And the risk of ill sacs lesion engaging or not engaging depends upon relative size of the ill sacs to the glenoid. So it depends. Uh, the, so the bipolar lesion is very uh, essential pathology behind the recurrent right. shoulder dislocation. And few author did, uh, did the dynamic evaluation of these engaging and non-engaging ill sacs lesion before and after the band cut repair. Though it is very risky to do uh, this evaluation after band cut repair because it will uh, may, it may cause the uh, failure of the repair. So before band cut repair, is the anterior capsular mechanism is failed as is failing, most of the ill sacs will engage. And the incidence of the engaging ill sacs before band cut repair can be as high as 52 percent. But once the uh, enter uh, the bancard bancard repair is done. The same same hill sacs may not engage. So those hill sacs which engages even after bancard repair are the true engaging hill sacs, and the prevalence is around seven percent only. So depending upon this glenoid bone loss and the on track and off track concept, the the different treatment modalities are designed for the solar dislocation. Now, a uh, short talk on the posterior shoulder instability. The posterior shoulder instability uh, is uh, mainly maybe due to various anatomic factors like excessive glenoid retroversion, excessive humeral head retroversion, and the pathology, uh, the uh, pathological uh, process associated with it, maybe a reverse ill sacs lesion, there may be reverse band cut lesion, there may be plopsa, there may be reverse haggle, and there is something called a Kim's lesion. This is a superficial tear at the junction between the posterior inferior glenoid cartilage and the labrum, but without a complete labral detachment. It is usually seen in young athletes with posterior shoulder instability. Failure to identify and address it may cause a recurrence and a persistent posterior shoulder pain. And coming to multidirectional instability, it is mainly due to repetitive microtrauma or due to generalized capsular ligament laxity. And the pathology behind it is usually the capsular plastic deformity or due to attenuation and distension of the rotator interval. Age play a significant factor in recurrence after shoulder dislocation. If the shoulder dislocation is in a age group below 20 years, the risk of recurrence may be as high as 90%. The reason may be because of difference in the collagen tissue in development. And if the shoulder dislocation is over the age of 40 years, the recurrence is less, but the injury risk to the rotator cuff group of muscle is high. And this may be due to loss of capsular labral elasticity and degenerative cough. And the incidence of rotor cuff tear may be up to more than 80% in a patient older than 60 years. The presence of greater tuberosity fracture associated with this shoulder dislocation in elderly may represent actually the avulsion of rotor cuff. And the repair of rotor cuff without band cut repair gives good outcome in them. And sex wise difference in the female sex, the uh, shoulder dislocation is relatively uh, less common than compared to male. And in, if we see the athlete groups, the most of the time the dislocation, cause of dislocation in female is usually a non-contact sport and the other pathology may be because of neuromuscular incoordination and hyperlaxity. 
and this group of patients shows more of the labral tears and hagal tears than the bony lesion uh, as compared to male. So there is something called a shoulder terrible triad, which is a triad of traumatic anterior shoulder dislocation with rotator cuff tear and fragile plexus nerve injury. And the, the rotator cuff repair gives the best chance for a favorable outcome. So to conclude with, the shoulder stability depends on the position of arm as well as activities of the muscle around the shoulder. The capsular ligamentous structure are the main stabilizer with arm at the end range of movement. The negative intraarticular pressure and concavity compression effects are the main stabilizer with arm in mid range of movement. And the traumatic shoulder instability is common in younger age and athletes. The recurrence is as high as 90% in less than 20 years. Knowing the pathoanatomy helps to determine the soft tissue and the bony lesion associated with solar instability. And this pathological lesion must be addressed depending upon the size and location by the surgery if they lead to recurrent dislocation. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Krishna? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sinsapa, sir. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Birg Basukola, sir, to uh, host the panel discussion session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna. Sunindra, can you please unshare your screen so that I could share? Okay. Vivek, there are questions in chat box. Why don't you take those questions? This is related to this talk, no? Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Krishna, can you take the questions? Okay. Okay, there are um, some questions uh, from the chat box. I would like to uh, point out them. Uh, one question is that dislocations are easily diagnosed and treated. Uh, subluxation is very commonly misdiagnosed and maltreated. As you said that uh, we will, uh, as you as you said, we will be discussing on discussion. Can you please share your experience on subluxation diagnosis and treatment? Mm -hmm. Subluxation, yeah, subluxation usually presents with uh, uh, in the usually seen in a subset of a patient, mainly athletes and uh, over overhead activity patients, uh, and they present with a sensation of some uh, dead shoulder, like they the shoulder suddenly gives away while doing that activity, and uh, they may feel some numbness or a mild subtle pain. And uh, if we go for an X-ray, then uh, usually it appears normal, uh, and then. If we go for a certain clinical test like a um, sulcus test and some apprehension test, they may be positive. And they are uh, slightly tricky to diagnose uh, as well as to treat, I think. And uh, in my experience, I haven't uh, been able to uh, diagnose a case of uh, shoulder subluxation. Uh, thank you. There is another question from Dr. Rajiv. I think um, let, let me let me add to it. Unfortunately, okay. uh, most of us uh, we you know take this subluxation as uh, shoulder pain, shoulder discomfort, clicking, you know, frozen shoulder, and all this kind of diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, the clinical tests are not very you know like uh, Sunil Doctor was saying. Uh, the sulcus signs are hundred percent; they are negative. X rays are usually normal. MRI also, unfortunately, usually uh, they are normal until unless you have a MR arthrogram, uh, the sensitivity for the diagnosis of uh, subluxations are very bad. But one test which is very important that all we have to do is a jerk and sift test, which is very, very sensitive to the um, subluxation. And probably doing a detailed history at what location you feel that sensation at what location you feel that clicking. And if someone is having that sensation in abduction and external rotation, if you put your first diagnosis as a subluxation, then you will detect it, you will find out the results. If you just, you know, he's not dislocating, just discomfort and just take it as a, you know, pain and send him for a, a shoulder physiotherapy, 100% chance you are going to miss the subluxation. As far as the literature is concerned, the incidence of subluxation is very, very high. About 40% of these patients who have shoulder clicking and shoulder you know, discomfort, they have instability, shuttle instability or subluxation. 
So if that is reported and we are not identifying this in our context, there is something wrong with our diagnosis. And this is the point I want to make that whenever we examine a shoulder, if it is not a frank dislocation, a subluxation has to be ruled out. Until unless it is ruled out, we will not go further. That is, that is what I said. And since I implemented a thorough uh, jerk and sift test, high degree of suspicion, you know, in last um, last two two and a half years, uh, we are getting a lot of uh, shoulder subluxation, you know, uh, detecting them. So probably it is not, uh, we don't have the incidence. It is we are not able to identify those subluxation. They are pretty common. Believe me, they are pretty common. That is what I wanted to put my point. Thank you. My, my comment and question is done. You can take some other questions, please. Dr. Krishna, please come in. You are muted. Okay. If there is a mid-range instability, then should we go for later day despite a small amount of bone, bone loss? This is the question from Dr. Rajiv. So it is not the, uh, the lethargy is usually reserved for a significant amount of bone loss, uh, except in a very uh, special situation. So I don't think the mid-range instability uh, demands is straightforward going for lethargy for small amount of bone loss. And if the patient is a high demand athletes or uh, uh, the, their other uh, uh, risk factors, medical uh, issues, some, uh, then we may we we can go for lethargy even with a small amount of bone loss. Otherwise, the for a lethargy to uh, be carried out, at least there should be a significant uh, more, more than twenty five percent of the glenoid bone loss. But some other, as I told, they take the subcritical amount of bone loss also as a significant uh, pathology, and they try to address it with uh, lethargy. But there are other procedures to uh, address it. And lethargy is quite uh, uh, extensive surgery with uh, a lot of complications. Thank you. Now, this is another question from Dr. Santukumar Gupta. Um, he has written, Dr. why Krishna. anti distribution? Dr. Krishna, Sorry. Uh, please, uh, the, um, Dr. Amit Joshi has raised his hand. Please see that thing as well, okay? Yeah. I'm okay, sorry. okay. okay. Um, I, think I, I would love to listen to Rajiv as well. What is his opinion? But this is a very, very important, you know. When we measure the glenoid bone loss, most of the time, attritional bone loss is very, very difficult to measure. It requires a different you know, mechanism to measure that. And the, most of the CT scan that we use to measure the bone loss, they do not measure the attritional bone loss. And the question what Rajiv has read is very, very valid. So mid-range instability means that there is a, uh, the glenoid, something wrong with the glenoid. So, um, in recent past, if I detect a mid-range instability, it is a direct go for a latarze for me. I'm not going to do a bank card repair for this patient. I would definitely love to listen to what is Rajiv's opinion as well. Rajiv Manandar, if you are around, you can share your opinion on uh, mid-range okay, instability. Okay, so Amit, I was a little confused because I didn't ask that question. Another Rajiv asked it. This is Rajiv anyway, Rajiv yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so just to talk on the two things that were talked about here. One was that subluxation. Uh -huh. I would just like to add to what Amit said. Uh, you know, uh, patients come and they say shoulder is going out, but then we find no evidence on the x-ray. Okay, so like he said, the clinical tests become very important here. And sometimes when the patient has repeated subluxations, you may see certain changes on your MRI on the CT scan. You know, you have these long-term shoulders which are going in and out. So you have this attrition at the inferior aspect of the glenoid and they show up on the CT scan or on the MRI. So that is another thing that we can look at. And most of all is, uh, you know, the people coming with rotator cuff symptoms. They come with uh, supraspinatus tendinitis. And these are because of subtle instabilities. So an unstable shoulder leading to a rotator cuff tendinitis. So usually this, this is my comment on the instability of, uh, you know, subluxations presenting with different types of symptoms. And on the other uh, point that Amit talked about, and uh, Sunil uh, said, you know, he told showed us nicely in his, showed us nicely in his presentation that mid-range mid instability is a very, very uh, uh, 
it is a very essential component that a shoulder surgeon must assess prior deciding on your surgery. And if the patient has mid-range instability, then there is some structural problem on the glenoid. So there is probably a glenoid bone loss. Okay. Otherwise, the factor that stabilizes the shoulder at that range, at you know, at lower ranges of abduction, at zero, at 15 degrees, uh, these structures, usually, these uh, instabilities don't really land up with a labral problem. So probably there's a glenoid bone defect or there is a muscular deficiency. So, uh, you know, directly going for a lateral J, we must assess whether it is. We must get investigations. And if you find there is a glenoid bone loss with mid-range instability, I think I would go for a bony procedure. I agree with Amit, we would want to go for a bony procedure to make sure, especially if the patient is an athlete or a young patient. I, I would I, I would I point. would request everyone to read a paper by Matskin, Matskin, who who developed this concept of mid-range instability in 2001. And in 2021, he has a comparative study of those patients who have mid-range instability and those who do not have mid-range instability after bank art repair and they have shown that 37 percent chances of failure of bank art repair so this is what i'm saying that if it is a mid-range instability in mid-range of shoulder yeah. abduction the stabilizing factor is the bony glenoid there is something structural defect of the bony glenoid you have to address that most of the time I'm not saying all will require a lethargic. Most of the time, at this moment, for mid-range instability, choice of treatment for me is lethargic procedure. Uh, also, just let me give a comment. I, I think uh, uh, one thing very confusing. I recently learned that engaging earlier there was engaging and non-engaging hillsatch, and now many people say that this concept is replaced by on track and on track, off track. You know. Let me elaborate a little bit on it that it is not replaced. This is extension on track of track is extension of engaging and non-engaging. So uh, Dr. Burkhardt gave us a concept of engaging and non-engaging. But how do you know it will engage or it will not engage after the bank card repair? That is what Sushil said that 40. Uh, we lost him, I think. Hello? Okay. I think we lost him. Uh, so... Yeah. Should we take another question? Yes, yes. Please go on. So, um, uh, one question is from Dr. Novin. Um, should we investigate or all the bank at or ILSAC in the first time dislocation in a young patient? His question is there. So, Navin sir, is it, is it okay? Uh, because we'll be discussing a lot about this in our panel discussion. I think we'll postpone this question for that time. It, it, will it be okay, sir? Yeah, correct. Okay. So, so, so final question, uh, Sunil Gai, why, why is entry dislocation and posterior dislocation? Entry dislocation is most common because the <laughs> the position in which uh, the shoulder becomes most vulnerable is the position of abduction, external rotation, and slight extension. And the the failure of this uh, entry stabilizing structure to withhold uh, the shoulder in position in this vulnerable position will lead uh, to a common dislocation. This is actually the mechanism by which the shoulder is located. The, to the force by which acts to dislocate the shoulder is in that direction. For posterior shoulder dislocation to occur, the mechanism is quite different, difficult, and it's not uh, seen with our day-to-day -day activities, except in some seizure disorder or in some uh, certain uh, anatomical uh, anomalies like dysplastic glenoid, or if there is excessive uh, retroversion of the glenoid or the humeral head, and that predisposes them to uh, the posterior instability. Otherwise, the actual, I think it's a mechanism of injury by which the shoulder dislocates. I mean, sir. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, my, my, that uh, concept, I thought that it's very important that we all should understand the relation between engaging, non-engaging, and the on-track and off-track. Many people think that uh, engaging and uh, non-engaging is different from on-track and off-track, and on-track, off-track is a newer concept. It is actually not that. It is extension of engaging and non-engaging. That is what I was trying to say. So Burkhardt introduced engaging and non-engaging, but he could not mention that which 
Hillsatch lesion will engage after the Bankart repair. So to identify which are the Hillsatch lesion that will engage after the Bankart repair or will not engage after the Bankart repair, to explain that this concept of on-track and off-track lesion has come. So it is not different concept. The on-track and off-track concept is extension of engaging and non-engaging. If a lesion is on-track, that means that it will not engage after the repair of the bank card. If your Hilsas lesion is off-track, that means that it will engage even after repair of the bank card. So that is the importance of understanding both engaging, non-engaging, and both uh, on-track and off-track. That is the only thing uh, I just wanted to highlight so that we all know what it it, it all about. Thank you, Vivek. And I absolutely agree with Sunil why uh, enter dislocation or it's just the mechanism of injury. Uh, Dr. Amit, can Master I just ask something ask one thing? Yeah. Hello? 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 Oh. Sir, Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah, you said that for mid-range uh, instability, usually you will go for the bony procedure. In that, we said that is usually the off-track lesion. If we are not doing the, uh, I mean, uh, the engaging, uh, I mean, off-track and on-track test, it is not possible doing all the places. So by uh, that uh, mid-range instability, and you prefer bony instability, can we say it is an off-track lesion? No, no, Sudip Dai, the mid-range instability, concept of mid-range instability is completely different. So what happens at mid-range means uh, 15, 20 degree of uh, flexion, 45 degree of abduction, and 90 degree of external rotation, unlike 90, 90, 90, you know, of uh, uh, instability test. So even if it is unstable at 45 degree of abduction and external rotation, that is called mid-range. So what happens at this position it is not the capsule or it is not the subscap which supports. The supporting structure is only glenoid curvature, glenoid bone. So if your if your patient has mid-range instability at you know 45 degree, then that means that your glenoid bone loss has some problem. So most of the time you need a, a Latarze procedure. That is what um, uh, the concept is. Okay, Dr. Ami. I think they're very uh, nicely elaborated, but in addition to the, you know, like bony defect in that situation, mid-range mid instability, could it be the, because the mid-range stability is produced in addition to the concavity and concave and concavity compression effect, which is also important part is the uh, uh, rotator cuff muscles, you know, like if there's any deficiency of rotator cuff muscles, especially let's say for example, for, to have it anterior, subscapularized weakness, all those, uh, dynamic structures, uh, you know, like uh, deficiency also might be responsible for the mid-brain instability. So in that situation, uh, thinking of, you know, like without uh, proper evaluation and then directly going straight away for latter -day procedure, I don't know, like, uh, can you tell me something about that? You, you are absolutely right, sir. These shoulder dislocation are not one mechanism that causes uh, dislocation. I absolutely agree. But if you understand the biomechanics of force coupling, the mm -hmm. rotator cuff force coupling is always directed towards the center until unless there is some gliding mechanism, you know. Unfortunately, what happens, what again I tried to elaborate earlier, the real bone loss, the traumatic bone loss can be carried it is and see that this 10%, 12%, 15%. Unfortunately, what we are missing is attritional bone loss, which cannot be calculated by a CT scan that we do. So in case of, in case, so let me finish, in case of mid-range instability, it is mostly the attritional bone loss which is effective. That is why nowadays there is a concept of doing latarze, more and more latarze for mid-range instability. But I absolutely agree, it is not compulsory, but it depends upon thought process, the understanding and the learning process. And any, I mean, I think uh, any role of pre-op investigations like, uh, you know, a 3D CT to evaluate the, by measuring the, you know, comparing, that additional bone loss by the normal, you know, like a, 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 a contralateral side uh, glenoid. So that additional bone loss actually can be measured preoperatively with that uh, uh, 3D CT scan, and then that can certainly help us to know whether bone loss is additional or not, right? Unfortunately, CT has not shown so much sensitivity in detecting additional bone loss, but there is an MRI cartigram coming up 
on uh, identifying this attritional bone loss. In subsequent years, we will understand what are those things and we will be better diagnosed. Uh, the summary, uh, if I can summarize on behalf of everyone, is shoulder dislocation is multifactorial. What we are doing is treating by one method, doing a bank art repair or doing a remplissage or, or doing a latarze. We are trying to treat all the factors that Sunil had showed us. You know, there may be so many factors, muscle, bone, is this and that. Probably we are missing something, pathology, and we need to understand the pathology before deciding what type of treatment to give. Thank you, everyone. Now, I would like to request Dr. Vivek Baskola to proceed with the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. That was very nice discussion, nice and lively discussion. Uh, Sunil Dai has made my life very easier because he has covered almost all about the pathological anatomy of uh, solar instability. So uh, we'll be discussing a little about uh, uh, what causes solar instability and uh, what are the basic approach to solar instability of our esteemed panelists. And then I have some cases, if time allows, I will take some of those interesting cases uh, for discussion. Sunilda, am I visible? Yes, yes visible, visible, visible and audible. Okay, thank you, Vijendra. So, <clears throat> uh, respected all, very good morning. I am Dr. Vivek Basukala. I work in AKB Center for Arthroscopy, Sports Injury, and Regenerative Medicine. And today I am going to moderate this panel discussion. Uh, on solar instability. We'll be discussing about decision-making in various solar instability conditions. So I have uh, esteemed panelists to discuss about this topic, uh, right from Professor Deepak Prakash Mahara, uh, Dr. Sudip Man Vaide, Professor Amit Joshi, and Dr. Rajiv Rajman. And so uh, we have very esteemed panelists with lots of experience in solar instability. So we'll be learning a lot from them. <clears throat> so let us start. The shoulder, as uh, Dr. Sunil has already mentioned, uh, shoulder is uh, the joint which is most mobile in our human body. So this shoulder mobility comes at the expense of stability. So this shoulder, which is most mobile joint in the body, is the, more, the joint which dislocates most often. So this shoulder stability uh, has been compared uh, with the hammock. Uh, in which uh, the two supporting structures like any stone or two um, trees and a hammock in which the, uh, um, the person is lying down uh, has been uh, compared with the IGHL anterior and posterior band and the band which connects these two bands. So this is uh, um, what is compared with the shoulder hammock in human body. Uh, the two attachment at the glenoid and humeral head, humeral neck and the um, whole of the humeral head acts as a uh, force or acts as a um, person who we, we will be suspending in that hammock. So what happens is if all the supporting structures uh, right from the uh, humeral head, humeral neck and the glenoid uh, is okay, uh, the person will be uh, lying down very comfortably in this hammock. But the moment there is problem with any, um, any attachment or any connection, then there will be instability. So this is very interesting concept of shoulder instability. This is the picture in which we can see the anterior and posterior band of IGHL and the connecting band which forms the hammock. Well, this hammock um, is a real thing which can be seen in this cadaveric dissection. So this hammock comes into picture, uh, comes into play whenever there is uh, the uh, motion that is vulnerable motion that is abduction and external rotation. So, uh, so this hammock is very very important, and these are various uh, instability uh, pathological lesions in shoulder instability, which uh, Sunil has already mentioned. So let us start uh, the panel discussion with this brief prologue. So I will start with uh, Mara sir. Uh, Mara sir. You, there are various uh, terminologies uh, that comes with the shoulder dislocation. There is acute dislocation, primary dislocation, recurrent dislocation, and habitual dislocation. How do you define these, these uh, various uh, terms? Okay. Uh, acute dislocation means it, if it happens for the, like uh, acutely, like it's not a subluxation, if the head comes out totally out of socket. So that can happen anytime for the first time, or it can also happen in the recurrent situ dislocations also. And in the recurrent dislocation, if head comes out, that is also called totally out of socket. That is also considered as a acute dislocation. 
primary dislocation uh, is certainly the in person having dislocated the shoulder for the first time. So it's a first dislocation. Recurrent dislocation means that any disloc dislocation of shoulder uh, more than once, like let's say two or more. So it is not necessary that, uh, uh, you know, like a conventional understanding was that Previously, that three dislocations in a year or something like that. So I think uh, it's, I, I think it's, I think it's a redefined. And then any dislocation that is, that happens for the second time after first dislocation is considered as a recurrent dislocations. And then patients should be taken off in that uh, in that line of treatment. Habitual dislocation is I think something very complicated and then uh, very difficult to explain because all those uh, like recurrent and then. Uh, uh, especially the acute dislocation, primary dislocation, all those could be most like most of the time they are traumatic situation, and then uh, but habitually something uh, very if the person individual wants to do it, they can do one they can subluxate or dislocate the shoulder. So it is usually abnormal muscle patterning, a traumatic situation, and then the um, uh, abnormal muscle pattern. So it is a very difficult situation. We have to be very careful about managing this. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, absolutely, the, there are no not much of confusion in acute and primary dislocation, but uh, recurrent dislocation terminology, the, the condition when we should label any dislocation as recurrent has been a matter of controversy. So, uh, my question to Rajiv, sir, is it uh, the same thing as Mara said, uh, Mara sir just uh, said that recurrent dislocation is more than once. Is it so, or is it like classical more than three times dislocation in a year? Rajiv, sir. Right, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Vivek, ah? uh, now, the thing is, uh, the terminology for recurrent dislocation has been, like Mora said, Mora sir said, more than three I times. Know, know, that, 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 that was the previous classification. I mean, that was. Sir, sir, you are muted, sir. Rajiv, sir, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So uh, the, the classically, we were taught that three times a year, if the shoulder dislocates, then it is known as a recurrent dislocation, right? But recent definitions, I think if you go to literature, it says 3.2 times. That's what literature says, right? Then the patient, the thing is basically, but the risk after the first dislocation, after the patient has a second dislocation, the risk goes higher. Mm -hmm. Now we had, uh, what I can tell you about what uh, programs that we've had we had a consensus for shoulder instability that was conducted by ASON. Yes. A lot of senior surgeons from India and from Nepal. And we, I think, reached a general consensus, taking all literature together, that maybe more than two times we would consider as recurrent instability. That's Absolutely. So, so uh, I, I wanted to bring that thing uh, here as well, because we, um, we had two back-to-back -back sessions on shoulder dislocation, mm -hmm. shoulder instability, and we, we made a consensus about uh, these terms in that, uh, in that uh, webinar. And we, we also published a book about that uh, consensus, step, consensus statement from ASON. So... <clears throat> Uh, next question is. So, wow. this is. Uh, Interesting. This is, ah, gara gara. So, uh, uh, this type of habitual dislocation, what are you worried about? Uh, are they in the, in the uh, client, are they your good client, or you are afraid to do surgery on them? <laughs> Thank you, Vivek. I'm actually, if I see this kind of case, I'm not worried about it at all because I'm not going to treat them at first instance. So, uh, so if I'm not going to treat them, I'm not going to have complications. So, um, these habitual dislocations uh, or voluntary dislocations, uh, uh, multiple etiologies, uh, I'm not going to detail of that, but most of these will do good with conservative treatment. Reassurance, rehabilitation, physiotherapies, uh, that is the main line of treatment for this patient. Okay, thank you, sir. So two conclusions from this slide. Recurrent dislocation means uh, not as the classic teaching, teaching more than three times in a year. Nowadays, it has completely changed and we had made a consensus in this. Recurrent dislocation means more than once if the shoulder dislocates, that is recurrent dislocation, we have to treat accordingly. And in these type of habitual or uh, voluntary dislocators, be aware to toss them because these are the patients which won't do better with any type of surgery and try to manage them, them conservatively. So, okay. Uh, next question is to Sudip, sir. First time dislocator, there is very much controversy uh, about this first time dislocation. What will you do to first time dislocators sir, in your clinic? 
Sudip sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First time dislocation definitely younger patients uh, less than twenty years or even around that age. My treatment will be just on a sling for uh, three weeks, and after that gradually uh, re I mean uh, rehabilitate them for another three weeks. That should be my uh, aim of treatment. No complete immobilization. What we were to practice before. Okay, sir. In cases of first time dislocation, whatever is that might be, you will never in, in investigate them with CT scan or MRI. Never. Uh, not really. But if they are uh, less than twenty years and they are of uh, the really athletic people, uh, like basketball player or throwing any kind of javelin throw, or those kind of sports, even certain people, we may have to investigate. Otherwise, uh, no, I will not investigate them. All the all primary dislocations. Okay, uh, Mara sir, uh, first time dislocator. What is your approach? Okay, I think uh, the most important thing is that we have to clinically. I mean, history is very important. The kind of you know uh, 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 trauma that patient has sustained to dislocate the joint because if it is a very you know like a, a very heavy sports like in that situation. Uh, gravity of the injuries could be quite high, so severity of injury quite high. So, and then the history is important, and more important is that radiological evaluation, plain X-ray. You know, like uh, to just plain X-ray gives a lot of information in the patients with the you know, acute first-time dislocation. Information number one is that whether it's anterior or posterior or whatever, like uh, types of the position wise. Another thing is that whether associated fracture. But the greater tuberosity fracture, or sometimes there may be a subtle fracture, you know, like a, a doubtful fracture in the glenoid side or in, in the neck of the humerus. So radiological evaluation is important. We should suspect sometimes if there is, you know, a simple plain X-ray AP. Sir, sorry, AP, sorry, AP. sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, if yeah. a case uh, came to you with first time dislocation with no fracture at all, uh, X mm -hmm. shows no fracture, there is plain dislocation. So what is your approach? So still then I would like to see radiologically in AP, we like to evaluate the sclerosis line, you know, like in the glenoid margin. If it is disturbed, then in that situation, if it is missing, I mean, it's not there, it means some we should suspect patho bony pathology in the glenoid side. Anyway, so whatever it is, first we have to immediately uh, do the, of course, as soon as possible, the close reduction has to be done. And then uh, uh, the, after once it succeeds, either uh, then you have to immobilize it for a couple of days, maybe, um, uh, around uh, approximately maybe around three weeks. Sir, know? my question is, uh, will you investigate more? Uh, the immobilization, everything we all do. Will you investigate mm -hmm. more with uh, online of surgical management? Will you investigate more? Okay, so the, in that sense, there is certain, uh, I think partly uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sudeep has already said that, then high risk groups, like let's say for example, to have recurrence of the dislocation after managing the uh, conservatively for the first time. So usually young people with less than 20 years and then high velocity, uh, sorry, uh, high impact injuries. So in indicating that, so this is likely to have a, some sort of bone loss also. So in that situation, uh, and then we would like to uh, get the CT scan also, and then of course MRI also in that situation. So, so, so your, your approach is uh, to all the high-end athletes and less than 20 years, if there is first-time dislocation, you always investigate with CT scan and MRI, right, sir? All, I think it is better. I like to do that, not to get, because there's chances of recurrence is so high just by missing it. So not for routine, not, we'll not be asking for that for the patient in the, in less, it is less than 40. So more than, sorry, more than 40 or elderly people, but in the young individuals to uh, minimize the chances of dislocation, I think we should investigate better. Okay, so I think uh, what what I can summarize, uh, what I can paraphrase from your, uh, your thought is that ideally these patients, these group of patients must be investigated at the first time dislocation, but we are not doing so, right sir? I don't know whether we are doing or not, but I'll prefer to do that. Okay. I cannot okay. say what. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, sir. So, Rajiv, sir, uh, this is very controversial talk. We we see lots of patients with first-time dislocation. Uh, any uh, input about this? Because I have uh, uh, shown two two good quality journals and do uh, the um, that is randomized control trial, which shows that early stabilization is better. I intentionally put this to distract. Yes. Okay. Okay. Rick, your little
literature looks very very impressive uh, very good for them i don't know on what individual these studies have been uh, conducted on if they are military individuals if they are high level sportsmen absolutely agree with these studies but mm -hmm. with the patients that i treat if you are saying that it is a simple dislocation a young patient with a simple dislocation the patient the type of patient that i treat i think i would go with conservative treatment unless there's some Dr. Sabal, please mute yourself. So for, the, for these patients, for the, for the patients that I treat, for, uh, for, for young patients, I would still go with conservative treatment for the first dislocator. So my question, sir. With uh, a good amount of counseling, with a good amount of counseling that if you dislocate again, you will have to undergo a procedure. Okay, sir. So my question, same question as to Mara, sir. Will you investigate those patients with CT or further invasive CT or MRI? First time dislocators. Vivek, if my clinical findings only suggest that he has a, a acute dislocation first time, no, I will not investigate. I will get an X-ray okay. and after my reduction. And if the X-ray appears normal, I will not investigate because I don't plan for surgery for that patient. Do you think that they... Uh, uh, because of some uh, cost issue, you have not investigated, uh, but they have to be investigated. Now, it depends. See, what is going to be the result of my investigation? Okay. If, I'm going to, if, if I'm going to deal with a military recruit or a high-level sports player, and if I decide that if this patient needs a stabilization procedure, then I will investigate. Okay. Otherwise, what is going to be the result of my investigation? I ask him to do an MRI and I tell him he has a bank card lesion. What is going to be the result of that okay. if I'm okay. going to treat, treat him with physiotherapy? Agreed, agreed. Okay. Amit, okay. sir, any uh, comments on first time dislocation? Uh, I, think, I think I absolutely agree with everyone, uh, Sudip, sir, uh, Deepak, sir, and Rajiv. But uh, my approach, uh, you know, since uh, I was in army hospital uh, for quite a long and they were very high demand people. And nowadays I'm treating lots of sports person. It has little changed, you know. So, uh, especially in those patients who are below 20 years, at Maharashtra was saying, and a patient is very high demand, and it is a traumatic injury, then uh, surprisingly, the incidence of uh, bony bank card is quite high, you know. That is, not, that is what we are missing. And to identify in these high-risk group, lesser than 20 years, very high demand, I will definitely investigate, but not with the MRI. I'll get a CT scan done compulsory routinely along with the uh, along with the X-ray, so that I decide either I will still conserve this patient, or if I find a bony bank card lesion, I will suggest him to get a, a fixation of this bony bank card. So thank you, Amit sir. So can we uh, conclude that uh, it is not absolutely necessary to investigate uh, further to do further investigation in all first time dislocated, but uh, you have to uh, be cautious enough in high athletes, high end athletes, and in those very complex trauma with very high energy injuries where there may be some form of bony injuries or when there may be some form of subtle bony injuries which may be missed in X-rays. In those conditions, we have to do further investigation. Otherwise, uh, as we normally do in first time dislocators, just relocate them and uh, keep immobilization for a few uh, weeks time, then do the physiotherapy, right, sir? Okay, so uh, next thing is, uh, about the risk factor which predisposes this first time dislocator for uh, repeated dislocation. So this is the literature which I have found. Uh, what is your comment about this, sir? Uh, Amit, sir? Amit, sir? So risk factor, male patient, less than 20 years, um, are the risk factor of uh, you know uh, recurrent dislocation of shoulder. Okay, so interesting thing when I search about the literature, search the literature about this topic, the uh, bony bank card is found to be a good indicator for uh, not to have re dislocation in the future. So, any comments, sir? Yeah, I agree because if, we, if you have a displaced, see, if it is a bony bank card, that indicates that the severity of injury is high, and we all know that. Higher the velocity of injury, lesser the chance of the recurrence. Maybe that is one of the reasons that can explain. Number two, if it is a bony bank card, it, the bone heals. 
rather than the soft tissue. You know, the healing of bone is better than the soft tissue to bone healing. Probably I can think of these two most important reasons why after bony bank art lesion, um, you know, the recurrence is less provided your bony component, it's, it is not resolved. So the recurrence is rare. Uh, that is what I think. Okay. Uh, my question is to Mara, sir. So uh, I have seen during my residency, lots and lots of cases, uh, at least one or two cases a day of shoulder dislocation. So that, that makes a lot uh, volume about the shoulder dislocation. Most of, many of them used to be first time dislocators and we used to prescribe physiotherapy to all of them. So uh, what is your experience? Are these physiotherapies actually work or these are just, uh, we are just doing it? I mean, how many of these first time dislocation, are there any data like first, these first time dislocation who had undergone good physiotherapy protocol has not had the second, second time dislocation? Mora, sir. Sir, you are mute. Mara, sir, you are mute. Okay. All right. I mean, I think physiotherapy is very important part. There is no doubt about that. I think we should subject the individuals for the physiotherapy after relocation because the muscles, which are muscles or any kind of uh, soft tissues that is lesion all around, and then even the rotator cuff injuries, like depending on the age of the patient, sometimes it might be there. So all these things certainly need some kind of rehabilitations, okay? And then uh, since it is a like interior mechanism, you know, like basically dislocation, for the anterior dislocation, there is primary anterior mechanism of uh, dynamic structures like, uh, let's say, for example, subscapularis, and then other rotator cuffs are also the secondary stabilizers for the anterior dislocations, I think. So after dislocation, these structures are certainly expected to have some sort of injury, depending on the severity and all the things. And after relocation, after letting them to heal in a couple of weeks, let's say three weeks or four weeks time, I think they need to be subjected for some sort of physiotherapy to regain their normal, you know, like uh, stretching, as well as at the same time, uh, strengthening also because dynamic stress can be trained. So I think um, it, is, it is not that it could be sir, trained, sir, depending sorry on the to legal, interrupt, sorry, my question. My question is, sir, uh, with this physiotherapy protocol, what you, what you have all mentioned, are, are they really decreasing the risk of second time dislocation or we are just giving it? My question. Uh, I think it is the second time dislocation is uh, not due to the weakness of the muscles. I think I think missing some anatomical lesions, you know, like it may be in a soft tissue or it may be in the even in the uh, like in even this bony injuries are maybe missing in the first time in the first okay. dislocation also. So okay. that because of that, uh, it is not you know, we can train only the rotator cuff muscles or dynamic structures around the shoulder. You know, like physiotherapy involves in that, but it will not address the other. So that depending on the what. Uh, pathology is going on there, is, is, depending on that. So that it will help certainly to make it better. But if there is a lesion associated, other lesions causing the uh, further recurrent dislocation, it is not going totally to prevent it. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Why I raised this question is this is our common practice. We relocate, uh, we immobilize, then we do physiotherapy, we do rehab. But the literature is very, uh, very divided on role of physiotherapy on uh, prevention of second time dislocation, prevention of recurrent dislocation, because some literature mainly from uh, physiotherapy side say that it is very good and it totally prevents the, uh, the recurrence of that dislocation. But uh, many papers uh, also mentioned that there is not so much of role of this physiotherapy. And uh, this is the main risk factors are age, sex, and the hyperlaxity, which will lead to uh, the second second time dislocation once the patient has first time dislocation. The first time dislocation is always it's itself a uh, reason for second time dislocation. If the patient has first time dislocation, it is for sure they will be having second time dislocation um, because of these all conditions. And physiotherapy will not prevent this second time dislocation. So that was the only reason. So physiotherapy we always do. We have to do. I think there is no other way. But uh, the role of physiotherapy in prevention of the second time dislocation is uh, very very controversial. So let us proceed. So generalized ligamentous. Vivek, Vivek, yes, yeah. yes. Sir. Vivek, can I make a comment here? Yes. So sir, I'll please. just quickly make a comment out here. Basically, uh, initially the teaching went like uh, the age of the patient, recurrent the risk factors for recurrent instability, age of the patient, damage at initial trauma, and the length of immobilization. Right. That's how we went. Right. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Sir. I think that uh, immobilization is also out because they say you have to immobilize for three weeks. What does yeah. everyone have to say about that? These days we don't immobilize for three weeks. We immobilize uh, for a week. Rajiv sir, Rajiv sir, can can we take yeah. the questions uh, a little? Okay, more? because okay. I have that uh, slide. 
So I will ask you, generalized ligamentous laxity. Do you evaluate each and every patient if you're in stability for generalized ligamentous laxity? If yes, why? Rajiv, sir. Uh, yeah, Vivek, uh, we used to evaluate or we still occasionally evaluate the beaten score. Yes. Okay, that's how it was done. We were taught. When I did my fellowship also, we examined the beaten score. But off late, they say that localized shoulder uh, hyperlaxity is more important than beaten score. That's what Lisa agreed, agreed. just said. Yes, yes. So now, if you do your, what what makes you feel, uh, what, what, uh, how can you diagnose localized hyperlaxity? You take the shoulder into external rotation on the side. So if your external rotation is more than 80 degrees, if the patient's external rotation is more than 80 degrees, or if the sulcus sign is positive, these are more strong indicators that the patient is more prone to have a shoulder dislocation, more than the beaten score. Okay, okay. Amit sir, your, uh, your take on generalized ligamentous laxity. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with Rajiv. Uh, the local uh, laxity and the generalized laxity are two different things, and their interference to outcome is different. However, in all my cases, I do a, a beaten scoring of this patient because to prognosticate. Most of the time, if someone who is having, um, you know, higher than six uh, beaten score, these people somehow do poorer. Even if you repair, if you, uh, you know, treat the localized laxity by doing a north to south shift of the capsule, these capsules are going to be stretched in due course of time if they have a feature of generalized ligamentous laxity. Sir, my so question, I use I use both of them. Yep. Okay. So my question: If you get uh, that gen, uh, patient has high beaten score, so will you consider not taking that case for surgery, or uh, your decision won't change? No, it depends upon what type of dislocation. If high beaten score and recurrent dislocation of shoulder. Rather than a uh, soft tissue procedure, I'll go for a bony procedure. Absolutely. So this is another point which I want to wanted to men, uh, make while making a decision about the surgical or any form of treatment. Always, always uh, see for the generalized ligamentous laxity. But uh, nowadays there is a concept as uh, uh, Rajiv sir has mentioned, the localized instability, or local, localized uh, laxity of the, uh, the lo localized shoulder laxity, which we uh, all must see. But I think uh, it's still uh, meaningful to look for uh, this generalized ligamentous laxity, do a beaten score. And if higher grade of beaten score is there, and if the patient presented with recurrent instability, it's good to do from surgery, uh, the bony procedure rather than purely soft tissue procedure, because these soft tissues will eventually stretch and this will lead to re-dislocation and recurrence of uh, the, the failure of that surgery. So let us proceed. So reduction technique, there are multiple reduction technique right from Hippocratic, very inhuman maneuver to Stimson's and scapular, manu uh, scapular manipulation techniques. Sudip sir, what is your preferred technique? Sudip sir. I think, yeah, I think from the day one, my technique is a simple cocker maneuver from my resident day. I've always found it a very, very good result. So okay. Cocker is my way of treatment and I always do it under IV anesthesia. There are so many uh, reduction medicine has been explained with the uh, gravity and with the patient conscious, but still I'm not very comfortable with those uh, okay. ways of reduction. So Sudip, always under IV anesthesia. Okay, so if, sir, have you had any complications while reducing? like uh, the fracture which was not there you 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 created the fracture because of yeah i think yeah i think i think only one case is which uh, the micro i mean sir, hairline fracture was missed and uh, it it got into fracture long back uh, otherwise okay. after that no because it was with a patient very nicely relaxed there is less chances of fracture rather than okay doing okay. it unconscious patients absolutely so mara sir uh, preferred technique with uh, preferred technique and any complications you had with this uh, techniques? I think uh, as uh, Dr. Sudip said, uh, like uh, classically we used to do all that the same technique, counter traction, traction, counter traction method and then all the things. But nowadays I think the new technique, external rotation technique has evolved. So, and then it is simple. And then I usually do now with the external rotation uh, technique even without any kind of anesthesia in emergency okay. cases. Okay. And as far as the complication is concerned, 
uh, I have not come across any kind of complications, luckily so far, but never know, like, <laughs> especially when you give the fraction counter fraction method like that. And then if you are by any chance missing the subtle, you know, like crack sort of fracture of the neck of the femur and all the things like that, sorry, neck of the humerus. So that might be displaced, you know, like, so those are the danger, but anyway, um, I have not come across any kind of complications. Uh, Rajiv, sir. What anesthesia? Mara sir told no anesthesia. Sudip sir, always IVA. So what is your preferred technique with anesthesia, without anesthesia? Okay, uh, Vivek, I, st uh, I start with local anesthesia, I infiltrate xylokine into the joint, and I usually use the hypocrites method. And uh, if my patient does not, in the same position where I'm pulling, if the patient does not relocate with my traction, then I do something which is a, uh, this called a method called a FAIRS method. So what I do is isolate and then I use, use go up, go, I go up, go up to about 90 degrees of abduction. Usually it relocates. There are certain patients who do not relocate, who are very tense and who have a lot of muscle spasm. We do take patients up under IVA. We've done patients under general anesthesia also, certain patients. That is not very common, but, and I work in a teaching institute. So I have seen a complication and uh, there was an elderly lady elderly yeah about um, uh, above middle age lady who had a shoulder dislocation manipulated by enthusiastic people definitely and uh, the caucus maneuver was done and there was a fracture of the surgical neck so okay. i have seen one complication so okay. i would recommend that in uh, you know these osteoporotic people i don't think you should try caucus maybe a gentler type of reduction and if your reduction there's a lot of muscle spasm i think you should increase the muscle relaxation that's the basic message i want to give Thank so you. there is more confusion now sudip sir cocker uh, Mara sir, Mills, that is external rotation. Um, uh, Rajiv sir, Hippocratic maneuver. Sir, uh, Amit sir, what is your preferred uh, technique? Vivek, one sec. I think they say, <laughs> literature says that, you know, there are so many techniques mm -hmm. and I think you you should just continue with the technique that you're comfortable with. Okay, okay. I think that's I, I, I think, Dr. Dr. Vivek, Dr. Dr. Vivek, Dr. Dr. Vivek yes, I just want to add thing. I think the more relaxed patient is very important. So your cooperation absolutely, is, absolutely. is a very important. Absolutely. And I have a question to Dr. Deepak Mayra because this is what I had experienced long back. I was in police hospital. I had my senior, uh, Dr. Anand Sreshta. Of course, he is no more now. And I was, he used to practice, I, he had learned it, I think, in Bangladesh, uh, that uh, doing it under without anesthesia, he used to say, Police wala, mukma, yo kapada chap, and nakara, and he used to pull it out. I think I used to find it very, very inhuman to reduce the shoulder without anesthesia. I don't know, uh, I maybe I should come to you and learn these techniques, but I find it very inhuman to reduce shoulder without anesthesia uh, in my experience. So I'm always comfortable with good, relaxing I anesthesia. I'm very comfortable. Just I have some more thing like. I, just said that I use that external, external rotation technique, which is simple in OPD basis or emergency room and without anesthesia. It does not mean that every patient can be relocated without anesthesia. Sometimes yes, if yes. it's difficult, if you are, you know, like you do not be forceful. And in that situation, uh, yeah. patient has to be taken up under yes, anesthesia. Yes. It is not that, but routine yes. practice generally, you can attempt to do that. And then usually you are successful in getting Absolutely, treatment. absolutely. I, I agree with that. That's uh, the idea. Uh, so, Amit sir, there is very uh, popular technique nowadays, very popular scapular manipulation where no anesthesia is required and patient hardly feels any pain. Uh, have you had any experience with this scapular manipulation technique, sir? Amit sir. No, Vivek. No, Vivek. I don't do I just do a simple external rotation technique. But I would like to add on one point that I, I always teach my resident. Whenever you get dislocation, don't jump into reduction. You can use any method, as uh, Rajiv said. Don't jump. Assess your patient. So there are two conditions. Primary or first dislocation, you are reducing in a young patient. First dislocation, you are reducing in a 75-year-old gentleman. It's completely different stuff, you know. So how you are going to reduce them? What method you are going? Method is immaterial. What to what you are, uh, you know, tuned to, you can use that method. Another thing is, if someone is a recurrent dislocation, who used to reduce his shoulder by himself seven times, now he has come eighth time to reduce it because it became irreducible. This is a completely different case. Yes. So you take the patient case by case. You understand what this recurrent dislocation is. Rather than understanding which method is good for reduction, you understand which, which uh, re uh, dislocation requires what approach, which dislocation requires 
without anesthesia which dislocation requires local iv or most of the time some dislocation may require a general anesthesia with uh, muscle relaxant so you assess according to that it becomes very good what sudip dai was saying that is a painful so if your reduction is not painful you can do is without anesthesia but your reduction should not be painful i think that is what uh, absolutely my absolutely so this is this is this is why i brought all these things to discussion because there is no perfect technique uh, the perfect technique is whatever you feel comfortable with so there are multiple techniques of reduction and i think you must master one or two of them and uh, and if the dislocation is in very heavy built person the younger age group perhaps you can do some manipulative traction and cocker strike method but if you are going to uh, implement these particular technique in a 75 or 85 with osteoporotic means you have to be very careful um, you 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 have to make sure that they are well um, relax otherwise there may be complications and um, another thing is uh, do do case by case basis because no technique is best technique master any one and do according and uh, i i would like to uh, take this opportunity to mention something about this scapular manipulation technique because during my residency one of my colleague had thesis in this scapular manipulation technique in which we we all in all our techniques what we used to uh, do is we manipulate shoulder we manipulate the arm um, but in scapular manipulation this is just opposite we manipulate the other side that is we just push the inferior angle of scapula towards the center and uh, we uh, the um, to tell you frankly because uh, while propose the he proposed this technique we we all uh, didn't believe about this technique but when we executed this technique this technique was so painless and we never uh, had uh, if there was associated other lesions only this uh, technique fell otherwise this technique didn't fell so i would like to request all of younger colleagues to try this technique uh, uh, for the scapula the reduction of shoulder so let us proceed uh, uh, mara sir so if the patient comes to you with acute dislocation at night time uh, will you reduce then and then or will you wait for uh, the morning so this happens very <laughs> I, I didn't have experience going at night nowadays at least then <laughs> so but on yeah reduction has to be properly evaluated before reduction patient has to be properly evaluated and then at least baseline investigations like x-ray and all these things has to be done so and then earlier the um, uh, attempt i think it will be better certainly i mean rather than waiting for oh, tomorrow morning let the sun rise and i'll go to the hospital i do it so and then who does it important and then Uh, of course like if the resident like you as you said clearly that your the residency time also your scapular manipulation was the thesis topic it means resident can do in the issues like any any where the dp program is going on so i think earlier the better so there is no okay. doubt about that rajib sir i think uh, all dislocations are emergencies right in orthopedics so i think with a reasonable person uh, manipulating definitely i think as soon as possible so so absolutely this is uh, the there are very few emergency conditions in orthopedics and dislocation is one of them uh, it, it's just like time is ticking and the cartilage viability is also going down so i think uh, earlier the better and many of these shoulder dislocation can be reduced uh, without anesthesia by gentle uh, maneuvers so uh, some of them may require some form of sedation and some huh? of them require uh, Uh, the general anesthesia so i think it's not wise to oh, very next day uh, for the um, that thing so anesthesia i think we have covered lots of thing lots of shoulder dislocation can, can be uh, uh, reduced with without any anesthesia some may be reduced with Uh, local anesthesia like hematoma block and some may require some sedation and some may even require the general anesthesia now comes immobilization uh, rajiv sir you were telling me about immobilization dr chandra bhushan please unmute please mute sir sir immobilization what is the preferred immobilization technique yeah so immobilization what i was saying at that time was uh, the factors for uh, recurrent instability initially we were taught that the age of the patient the damage at instability da damage at initial trauma and the immobilization okay now i think the latest guidelines i think that immobilization is a little doubtful and i think hyperlaxity and the uh, lesions the bony lesions have been included 
I think the new uh, uh, factors for recovery. Sir, I have shown you four four types of immobilizers. Which are these? Yeah, I I I would go for arm pouch sling. Okay, simple arm pouch sling, right, sir? Simple arm pouch sling, yes. How long? One week in a primary in a in an in a first time dislocator, a week or ten days. Okay. In a recurrent dislocator, as soon as the patient is comfortable, I think we can remove the sling. Okay, Mara sir. Yeah. Mara sir, your preferred immobilizer and duration. Mara sir. Mara sir, are there? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, simple collar and cough. Uh, sorry, I'm the arm post sling uh, immobilizer. Simple. And then uh, even up to three weeks, sometimes we go, but anyway, the trend is changing and then people are saying that, okay, lesser num number of days to immobilize, seven days, 10 days. I think practice has been changed. Otherwise, classically, we used to immobilize for three weeks earlier. So any change in first-time dislocator and recurrent dislocations? Uh, I think first-time dislocation is slightly longer than in recurrent dislocation is less painful situations. And so I think even earlier than the acute dislocator. So first-time recurrent dislocations can possibly be mobilize even earlier so uh, the message is very clear from this uh, from this slide no need to uh, put the bulky bulky type of any uh, painful type of uh, immobilizers like shoulder immobilizer chest arm slap strap and all uh, just apply simple arm posting that is better and in cases of first time dislocator because it is a severe injury so i think uh, the consensus is immobilize her immobilize for a little long that is one week or 10 days till pain subsides uh, till these ligaments heal then th these structures heal and in recurrent dislocation this is continuous phenomena i think uh, the immobilizer should be used till pain subsides. And regarding the uh, position of immobilization, there are various controversies. Some put it in, there is some. there are some papers which say that external rotation is better in position and internal rotation is not so better position. But this is all controversial thing. And I think simple arm posting is uh, the way to go. So <clears throat> how long to immobilize? We have already discussed. Uh, Mar uh, Mara, sir, is and dislocation, are there any relationship uh, with this thing? You have already mentioned there is something to do with uh, rotator cuff injury in um, the older age dislocation. So how will you approach differently in this old age dislocations? Because you see, old age dislocation means uh, the chances of, uh, you know, like uh, rotator cuff injury and osteoporotic fractures, you know, is certainly uh, more common. So more likely to happen uh, in the two dislocators rather than in the young children. So I think, um, uh, so approach to, you know, like to manage, of course, once you, it is acute dislocation, so you, it has to be in your initially reduced. Then subsequent management should be, should always think in mind that whether that patient is having associated with a rotator cuff lesion or any osteoporotic fractures, minor fractures also. Okay. So of okay. course, fractures will be obviously be visible even in plain x-ray, most of the fractures, if okay. it is uh, like, like displaced uh, retrochantric fractures uh, will be uh, of, uh, you know, any other associated fracture. But sometimes, the fractures in uh, in these elderly people will be subtle, and then uh, let's say even if the greater trochanter is fractured, it might not be visible, like in a hairline sort of fracture. Agreed. Agreed. So, so is, yeah, so is true for the uh, fracture neck of the you know like uh, humerus, surgical neck of the humerus. So I think we have to be more careful about that, and then before manipulation, and then we should tell patient that these are the possibility, like. If it is undisplaced fracture, sorry, or hairline not visible in X ray fractures. So, in, on an attempt to do the close reduction, we might be surprised subsequently after close reduction sometimes. Okay. So, it will be so disappointing to the patient, uh, you know, like it is something like iatrogenic or something like that. So, I have to explain to the patient beforehand that what, what are the possibilities uh, like uh, before doing close reduction. Yeah. So, can I summarize that, uh, sir, what you, what you uh, wanted to mention please, is please. with yeah. old age, you have to be careful about the osteoporotic fractures and be careful with them. And with all A's, be careful about the uh, concurrent uh, rotator cuff injury, right, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Vivek, Vivek yes, can, yes. Can, I, can I summarize in a little different way? Yes, what, yes, uh, see, when, when you get a you know, dislocation in elder A's, so first you diagnose that. And in diagnosis, you identify fractures, then you identify the rotator cuff. Yes. Second, 
reduction. So while reducing, you should be very gentle because these people are very, very osteoporotic. Most of the time will require general anesthesia and agree, muscle agree. relaxant. Agree. Number three is immobilization. These older people are very prone for um, shoulder stiffness after uh, immobilization. So you do not immobilize them for very long. Straight forward after three, four days, start a range of motion exercise. And then the follow-up. These people in follow-up will develop very meticulously because if you have not diagnosed the rotator cuff tear in the initial one by doing an MRI, you regularly follow this up patient to identify either the patient is having abduction, active abduction or not, so that you can detect these rotator cuff tear as early as possible if you have missed in first instance. So the approach is wise different uh, is in each step or each step it is different. So you have to take it that way. Absolutely. I think it's the same Absolutely. thing I differently summarized. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, one more thing I'd like to yeah. add. Uh, yes, Mark. sir. Please, please, okay. sir. Can I? Please, okay. please sir. Uh, as Amit said very correctly that because rotator cuff tear and the patient is not able to abduct after uh, close manipulation, after reductions of the joint, then sometimes we think that it, be a, it may be a knob injury. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So because knob injury. So a knob injury can be there anyway. So, but we should definitely rule out as soon as possible the rotator cuff lesion by doing, if, if patient have not able to ab actively abduct, we should suspect rather than uh, most of the situation is more important for this particular patient is the rotator cuff injury. So we should the subject the patient for some sort of MRI to rule out, make sure that it is not due to knob injury, it is due to rotator cuff. Otherwise, if you miss it, Considering that it is a simple neuropraxia of the axillary knob injury and patient is not able to do or something like some knob injury, I'm not axillary, I mean, the, in that situation, it might be retractions of the, you know, like a defect and then this repairable small defect might be unrepairable subsequently in the long run. So I think that is very important approach for the investigation. Absolutely, absolutely, Mara sir. So that was um, the very nice summary of A's and dislocation. I think there is difference in every step uh, in dislocation, right? From mechanism of dislocation, the way we reduce it, the uh, the the time we immobilize, and then further follow up. So message is very clear. In old days, be very careful uh, to deal with them because uh, their, their, their bone are already osteoporotic, cortex are very thin. If you do very strong maneuvers, you may fracture. The hairline fractures may be there, which may be invisible in excess. So you, may ha you have to be very, very careful. And immobilization, because they are very uh, prone to stiffness, uh, mm -hmm. you do immobilization as short as possible. And third one is do proper uh, follow-up in these patients because rotator cuff injury is very common with dislocation in old age group. So if they cannot do active abduction in the follow-up, uh, never hesitate to do MRI because uh, the rotator cuff injuries are very common. And as Mara said, sir said, the axillary knob injury might also lead to loss of abduction, but uh, what literature says is the axillary knob and uh, axillary knob injuries are more common in younger age group because th there are uh, high energy traumas in these, these population. So uh, the, the axillary knob injury is more common in younger age group and uh, the cause of loss of abduction as because of rotor cough injury is more common in older age group. So you have to be very careful. So this next question is about investigation. Sudip sir, I would like to ask Sudip sir to take it. There are multiple uh, x-rays views that is mentioned in literature that is mentioned in our book, uh, right from AP, axillary lateral, velcro lateral, and these various views. So what is your practice? You do all these views or you don't? Sudip sir. Hello, yeah. And so routine cases, I think uh, the AP view, uh, as far as, and the one axillary views. I think these are the uh, two views is going to give me a primary assessment of the patients. And only if required, I'll prefer for others. But I think primarily the AP view and the axillary view. Uh, these fancy views like West Point views, striker nose views, have you ever uh, advised no. them? No, I've not embraced them and I've not found anything of significance. Okay. If at all later on, if I find I might go for the MRI or okay. this thing. Okay. But in the auxiliary view, I can make out the Bankart's uh, lesion, sorry, the uh, hill sac lesions. Yes. And um, uh, I cannot really assess the lesions, uh, the amount of defect in the glenoid by x rays. So if I suspect, I'd rather go for MRI for the better understanding. 
and then suspecting. So I think plain X-ray, AP, and the axillary view is sufficient. For okay, me. okay. Thank you, sir. So I think with the advent of MRI and CT scan, these all uh, various views are not so much important, and these are of academic interest only. So I will ask Rajiv, sir, who works in Academic Institute uh, Medical College. So do you do this uh, views, various views uh, in uh, KMC? Is it routine? Rajiv, sir. Oh, he's just admitted. Uh, Mara, sir, I, I would like to ask you. Okay. So I need routine. Uh, see, very important thing to x ray subject the individual for x ray is that because acute dislocation is quite painful situation also. Okay. okay. So, because of that, simple x ray views are important. That, see, West Point view, all those, you know, abduction behind 90 degrees is not possible in the acute dislocation. That may be very important for the recurrent dislocation to define the situations of the green white bone loss. Okay. In x ray. Okay. So, Simple AP X-ray in AP, as well as maybe if you can do internal rotation or external rotation view also can be done. And then if, if it is pain uh, like a parameter because of less, less lesser pain. And then the, you know, like glenoid view, I think the simple AP green oblique view, glenoid view, I think is quite important to see the, any injury to the glenoid or bone injury to the glenoid. So uh, simple X-rays are very important and we have to analyze very carefully the, as earlier, so I mentioned that simple X-ray is quite informative. Also, just to know whether the patient has uh, any kind of suspect, suspicious bony lesion, like sclerosis in the AP normal uh, X-ray, uh, normal uh, shoulder, there will be sclerosis in the green white uh, margin. You know, if the sclerosis is lost, okay, is, is not visible, then we should suspect bony lesion in that patient okay. and then maybe a bony bank card or something like that in that situation we have to do further investigations so my question is these fancy views uh, is it a practice to do or is it, it is just academic purpose West point view it's, it's better yeah it is better to know like all the views may, may be not possible to be done in acute dislocations acute dislocation okay. is simple views so mara sir question to you ct scan or mri in cases of shoulder dislocation to evaluate I think uh, to, if, if you have to define adequately the bone loss, I think CT scan is the more important. If you have to define soft tissue uh, injuries like osteocartilaginous and then uh, or so soft tissue. patient came to you with uh, recurrent dislocation. He has dislocated 10 times. X-ray looks absolutely normal. So okay. CT scan or MRI in that case. And that's the reason for, I think definitely to evaluate the bone loss, I think I'll prefer the CT scan. If, if, if I have to prefer, I have to prefer the CT scan. CT scan. Also. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rajiv, sir, are you in? I'm in the day. Come in. Okay. So CT scan or MRI? MRI. MRI. Okay. Yes. Now there is more confusion. Uh, Sudip, sir, CT scan or MRI? Mm -hmm. Sudip, sir? Hello. Yeah, yes, definitely. Sir. Primary, uh, I mean, recommendation will be MRI, which will give me the maximum information. And if I'm not able to get much information regarding the bone loss of the uh, the glenoid, then in those cases, I'll go for CT scan. Otherwise, primarily always MRI. That gives me the maximum information. So two votes for MRI, one for CT scan. Amit sir, what is your vote on? <laughs> I I actually I actually love to do both. But if I've given one option to choose one out of these CT scan and MRI, I'll definitely choose MRI first. I'll see in MRI because some degree of bone loss can be seen in MRI as well. So if I find that there is a bone loss in MRI, then I'll contemplate with the CT scan. But the CT scan is not my first choice of investigation. But given me both the option, I'll do both. If one, it is MRI. So this is very uh, controversial topic. Uh, the literature is divided in this uh, this matter as well. Some say there is uh, the Bankard lesion occurs in almost about 90-95% of all shoulder dislocations. So why to do MRI? Let's do CT scan because decision making is all because uh, all based on the bone loss. So what is your take on this? I mean, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Yeah, we, with, the bone, with the bone loss, there could be so many soft tissue lesion, you know, haggle, reverse haggle, so many other lesions that could be missed. And those are, uh, along with the bone loss, those are also important stuff that needs to be considered when you do a repair or reconstruction. So, you know, okay. so okay. understanding the whole pathology, the gamut of pathology, it's, it's better to do all the investigations. Okay. Uh, Rajiv, sir, you wanted to tell something? 
Vivek, basically the thing is, see, what are we trying to do? That's the question. The investigation is going to help you decide your treatment. Okay. So, like Amit said, if you have only a bank, a shoulder dislocator may have multiple lesions. He may, okay. may have like the circle concept we just talked about previously, right? Mm -hmm. um, he may have an anterior injury, he may have a posterior injury, he may have a haggle, he may have a slap. So, to find out, I think, if there's no suspicion of any bone loss, an MRI would be a more reasonable investigation because that would help you decide on your surgery. Now, if you're thinking bone loss, then definitely to quantify your bone loss, you need a CT scan, which cannot be done very well on an MRI. So, Rajiv, sir, so if a patient comes to you uh, with very easy dislocations, like uh, dislocated 40 times, 50 times, and even dislocates at the night time, so at that time, will you choose CT scan over MRI? Uh, with a normal X-ray? Uh, with a normal looking X-ray. So if it's a normal x-ray, if my investigations tell me, if my clinical examination tells me that I don't suspect a bony bank cut, yes, the first investigation I would go for is an MRI. Okay. So okay, can, I, can I add something? Yes, yes, sir, please. I think it's very, uh, uh, you know, like uh, very difficult to be choosy sometimes. And then all, all, all of us are uh, our own opinion. So I think multiple dislocations, like there are in you know, the clinical, you know, like preoperative clinical suspicion, like patient, who has multiple this more the more easy the dislocation more multiple the number of number of the dislocations the more the chances of bone injury bone deficit uh -huh. so that is also uh -huh. so because of that it's not that do only mri or ct scan you can do both but i get, that's why i'm telling you if it is a multiple dislocation as you said 10 15 times so it is not a simple it is quite a multiple so i think bone uh, that's why i Say that CT scan I'll do it first. Of course, it will be if the, if there is no bony defect in this, then we can go for MRI also. So this so, is, anyway, it is true. this has been a controversial topic, and this yeah. has become controversial in this panel discussion as well. Uh, if given chance, I think we have to do both because yeah. uh, the decision making depends on both MRI and CT scan. So if uh, but uh, what recent literature says is. Uh, the, there is some techniques which which is uh, there are some techniques which has been shown very effective in measuring the bonus even in MRI. So if in two of these techniques, if appropriate investigation has to be chosen, I think uh, nowadays literature is more inclined towards the MRI than the CT scan. But uh, having said that, if as Mara said, uh, sir already mentioned, if there is uh, risk of injury of uh, th there is history of repeat dislocation easy dislocation and on clinical examination if you suspect there is mid-range instability there is bony apprehension test positive then i think ct scan is the way to go so i think this this is the uh, this is this should be the Vivek, uh, conclusion yes sir. Vivek, yes. my question to mara sir so suppose a patient comes with 25 dislocation he did a ct scan and he finds out that there is no bone loss what is his next step yeah of course you go for them right <laughs> okay <laughs> obviously obviously okay so i think uh, the, the this is always always a controversial and this has become controversial as i have already mentioned so ideal is do both but uh, at least recent literature is more inclined towards mri this which is which i have uh, found in uh, during literature search while i prepared this talk so okay uh, when to decide surgery i will skip this uh, i'll go for case because at least one case i would like to take uh, uh, Rajiv, sir, I would like you to take this case. So, 27 years male student, recurrent dislocation seven times, last dislocation one month back. He has stopped all his active sports because of fear of dislocating it. Treatment was reduction every time, followed by physio, physio, physio. And he always had recurrent, dis re repeated dislocation one to two to two, then it's seven times. So, what next? So first of all, every patient a proper history. So we need to find out how he had his first dislocation, whether he that went was, to the hospital for fall reduction. From, fall, fall from motorbike and reduction was done okay. at the hospital so, by health personnel. Okay, so this, this shows trauma, okay? And yes. he had an anterior dislocation, right? Yes, yes, right, sir. Yeah, so this is the first time. So second thing I would like to ask him is whether he has any dislocations when he's sleeping. No. That is very, very uh, important in the history. No, no. Then, uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And uh, so seven times. Last time, uh, yeah. So he was dislocated. Uh, yeah. So then after that, on clinical examination, we will assess for mid-range instability, 
we will check for apprehension we will do the load shift test finish our clinical examination yes. now if he has uh, whatever i will keep my findings aside then okay. i will go for an x ray okay. okay so what is my x ray finding my x ray is normal this is the x ray sir this is all we have some oblique view of shoulder joint and not so true ap view of shoulder joint yeah so what what i can see on this x ray it's a normal x ray mm -hmm. okay the joint is reduced there is no uh, I, i don't know whether the other panelists agree with me there is no bony bankart mm -hmm. okay there are no fractures there everything looks okay mm -hmm. so uh, looking at this i would go for an mri okay this is mri sir sagittal oblique axial the important films only have been uh, put it okay so i can see a bankart lesion obviously yes absolutely okay. anterior inferior uh hill sacs is not there small very small hill sacs not very small, small hill sacs yes sir small small hill sacs yeah any glenoid so there's a small hill sacs any glenoid bone uh, loss i i don't think there's any glenoid bone loss like on the uh, no there's no glenoid bone loss okay on the sagittal cut also i can't see any glenoid bone loss in okay and this patient has no mid range instability clinically oh. also no mid range oh. instability right so would you okay. like to go uh, advise ct scan in this case so like i said vivek if there's no uh, clinical uh, parameters if there no sleep dislocations if there no there's no mid range instability if my mri says there's no bony problem or the x ray says no bony problem i would not like to go for ct scan okay uh, we did ct scan in this case and this was the okay. ct scan finding bone loss 6% so any advantage of doing ct scan in this case you, you uh, we did a patient you would have yeah uh, in in this patient i i don't think there was any advantage because you would for bone loss 6% also you are going to do the same procedure no okay okay so this is example because if uh, by clinical examination there is no uh, mid range instability no uh, yeah no signs of bony abduction just then i think this and is and one 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 point vivek one point yes. i want to make out here is see when we are looking at these films on the mri i'm looking at these microscopic films okay which i have to really strain and look at when oh. the radiologist looks at these films he can blow them up and look uh -huh. at it so if he if you have 6% bone loss he's going to tell you on the mri only then yes. that would probably tell you if he gives you an indication there is a bony problem then maybe if you need you go for a ct scan uh, so uh, what I next uh, right. sudeep sir so you have bankart seven time dislocation bankart with uh, bankart lesion uh, not so much of glenoid bone loss some uh, hill sac lesion some little bit of hill sac lesion sudeep sir Yeah, definitely less than twenty-five percent of the bone loss, and with the only absolute uh, bank card lesion. These are the good patients for arthroscopic uh, bank card repair. Okay, so uh, as yeah. uh, has been uh, uh, this consensus uh, of our panelists, uh, this is the true case. This is a good case for arthroscopic uh, stabilization of anterior uh, glenoid labrum. So, a bank card repair is nothing because uh, this is just re-stitching the torn and displaced anterior inferior labrum to the glenoid. So. what happens is because of anterior inferior dislocation it avulses the glenoid labrum from the glenoid surface from the glenoid bone and what happens is because of this the shoulder keep on redislocating and in uh, uh, the um, the bankart repair we uh, repair that back to its normal position with the help of anchors and this is what we did uh, this is the anterior inferior glenoid uh, the the glenoid labrum was lying deep there and scarred and the most important step in the uh, bankart repair is good Uh, mobilization of this scar tissue up to the sub uh, subscapularis still the bleeding of subscapularis there we can see because of liberation the the scar tissue has come up in in its anatomical position now second step is good preparation of the bony bed for healing so we are uh, saving it, saving it out then uh, we we are putting the first anchor at about 5 o'clock position then uh, what we did was we Uh, put the uh, we pass some uh, suture passer, then subtle the suture with this thing, then took another suture from anterior labrum. The, this is the second bite from the same anchor. This is the mattress suture type, and this is 
again the uh, settling of suture now another step is tying this nut see how this bump comes over this glenoid surface this is this is just this seems very simple because uh, it is nothing just to restore the anatomy we are not adding any bone or uh, something because we we are just bringing the uh, displaced um, uh, glenoid labrum back into its surface with the help of the anchors and this is second anchor being placed and uh, what we did in this case was we placed three anchors uh, because of sake of time and this is the remplissage with uh, uh, remplissage procedure in which the whole of the uh, hill sac lesion is covered by the infraspinator so uh, my question to rajiv sir is uh, how many anchors literature is divided two three four how many anchors for bank card repair what is your so, uh, basically yeah so the literature says at least three to four yeah. not less than three okay okay amit sir as much as it is required you know it depends upon the labral tear how big is the labral tear you can get away with the two anchor if the labral tear is really short if your labral tear is long you may require um, you know four five if your labral tear extends behind then you may need to add uh, more so okay. what is important is the spacing of your uh, stitches spacing of your anchor rather than the number of the anchors it is good to understand the number of the suture anchoring the labrum towards the glenoid so in so your I practice it, sir uh, most of your cases uh, two okay three 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 okay. anchors okay vivek vivek you're talking about the case that you type of case that you showed us right yes yes sir the inferior labrum tear not uh, like pan labral tear no no this no. type of tear yeah okay, okay. uh vivek yes sir please just uh, for the academic sake like uh, you have uh, the bankers in this like remplis charge as well right for yes. this side and then since you have done uh, the ct scan also in this patient not uh, you know only with the mri and then since you have done that you could have taken uh, we can take and you not taken that we can take the advantage of measuring the you know like the depth or width of the uh hill sac region in this because and of of course then we can always calculate uh the okay the hill track in this so yes, keeping sir. those together you can see that the hill sac region is too small it's mm -hmm. not engaging so that the, the, the remplis has maybe avoided in this situation also like simply doing the bank cards and coming out maybe a uh option also that's what i'm thinking like uh what do you say about it so i will uh, i'll pass on the operative and pre operative measurement of the hill sacs and then uh, in relation to the uh, uh, glenoid tract you know okay so uh, so so i i so morris sir so i little little li 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 like to highlight what sir uh, is trying to say i understand what sir is trying to say basically i think uh, vivek my counteract to what sir is saying is what he's saying is i agree with what he's saying and uh, basically this integrity with would be Injury severity score help in this situation. The IS IS maybe it would help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. The parameters of IS IS may help here to decide whether the remplissage is needed. You know, a more severe procedure is needed. Okay. Only not looking at the MRI and the CT scan. Like for example, the age of the patient. Uh, though we have both bank cut and heel yeah. sacks, the type of sports mm -hmm. uh, sports yeah. participation of the patient, whether he's uh, undergoing any contact yeah. sports, you know. Whether the patient has hyperlaxity, maybe what Sir is trying to say something like this. I think you know, yes, maybe yes. that would help in deciding. And maybe Vivek took those into consideration and did a remplissage. Maybe yes, that's what yes, I yes, yes. Okay, agreed absolutely. So we'll go for second case. I would like uh, Amit sir to take this case. Twenty-two uh, years male boxer, recurrent dislocation thirty times. Last dislocation at sleep. He stopped boxing because of uh, this uh, dislocation. Treatment is same, reduction followed by physio, physio, physio. What makes sense? Uh, again, I'll not repeat what Rajiv said. It is meticulous history, examination, investigations, and then planning the treatment. In investigation, in this sense, this is a professional boxer. I'll definitely do, without any doubt, I'll do MRI and the CT scan to decide what will be the treatment. Okay. But uh, okay. at the at the very outset, I'm a little bit inclined towards the Latarzi procedure since he's a high demand boxer. So this is MRI. So he has a, a Bankart lesion. He has a, a Hilsas lesion, which is about 12.5 if you use a funky pizza technique roughly. Uh, and then there is a, you know, sloping of the anterior glenoid. There may be some degree of uh, uh, bone loss. I'd definitely love to see a CT scan. 
Okay, this is the CT scan, sir. And first view of the glenoid, both glenoid. Uh, so as as uh, you know, as we see, there is a, a reasonable bone loss. Uh, we have not measured it, uh, but probably it will come around twenty, um, around twenty. So. Uh, I'll go ahead with the Lotarze procedure for this. So patient. this is hill sac lesion, and while uh, if we make the eighty-three percent as described by Ezio, the tracking diameter, uh, the lesion was uh, found to be off track. So, uh, and this so, is uh, true, true, Vivek. This is this is very important. Okay. Wait, Vivek. This is very yes, important. Yes. You know, uh, you are you are showing how you calculated or what? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, show me, and then I'll talk. So this is this was the bone loss. The total diameter of uh, normal glenoid was 31 millimeter, and compared to uh, normal abnormal, uh, uh, the 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 abnormal uh, glenoid had nine millimeter of bone loss. So percentage of bone loss was 29 uh, percent, and uh, the tracking diameter is um, the tracking diameter we calculated tracking diameter with this formula and we plotted this tracking diameter onto this ct scan which uh, showed that the hill sack is off track so now what how will you approach this case sir i uh, still latarse and then fortunately latarse put up uh, increases the glenoid width so your uh, on off track um, and the hill sack lesion will be on track if you put a bone in front of it Looking at the number of uh, amount of you know uh, bone loss, which is about thirty percent, I'll definitely counsel my patient. Uh, my options to him will be a classic latarze, a congruent art latarze, or even you know thirty percent bone loss. I can go of a Eden hibernate procedure as well because thinking of the massive thirty percent bone loss is a too big a bone loss for me, and thirty time dislocation as well. Okay, uh, Sudip sir, any change in opinion? Sudip sir. Sudip sir. Okay, uh, he's not around. Now. Yes, sir. Please. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, whether you'll go for the. Your question was. So uh, Amit sir has decided uh, to do some bony procedure, uh, right from classic to congruent arc to Eden hibernate. Accordingly, uh, on table he will decide. So, will you change your plan? Of, um, have you had uh, something different to do in this case? No, no, definitely because this is a glenoid tracker is off track. Yes, uh, and uh, it is definitely requires uh, bony procedures. Uh, the okay. only soft tissue is not going to help. So this was what we did. Uh, we did. Uh, can, the I, class. can I? Can Yes, yes, sir. Please, please, please. So uh, it, I think it's a quite severe bone loss. Like it's, uh, I mean, as the classically said, it's more than twenty-five percent. If it is on on track, then you do only latarze. Mm -hmm. If it is uh, severe bone loss, more than twenty-five percent, and then off track, then you add soft tissue procedures like the in this. So that could be the option also from my side. Okay, so you would like to add remplissage, uh, uh, right, sir? Yeah, because it's a uh, uh, Vivek, Vivek, yes, yes, I, I absolutely yes. sorry, just add that on track and off track was calculated based upon the bone loss. Absolutely. In, absolutely. The, in that case, the width of the coracoid was not taken into consideration. Yes, yes. So if you consider when you reconstruct the glenoid, your glenoid width will be more. So that on track lesion will be off track if you put a uh, a bone plug into the anterior glenoid. That is what I wanted. So I, I'll try to explain. That. And most of the time, yes. And most of the time, uh, the procedure into the you know uh, hillsas lesion is not required. In very severe cases, we have grafted the hillsas lesion yes, as well. Yes, Done yes. the bony procedure yes. in that. So I'll try to. Uh, Wait, uh, can I can I make a comment? Yes, here? yes, sir. Please, sir. Yeah. If I'm still very anxious, okay, in this situation where Amit has already counseled for latter J, congruent latter J, he has counseled for an Eden hibernate also. If I'm still very anxious, I will measure the hill sacs also. Okay. Okay. And I will tell the patient that I will either cover the hill sacs with a bone graft or I will do a remplissage. Okay. So if you do that, it's a total so, situation. So in, in this case, case in this yeah, case, so you have you have planned to do letter J. So will you still add uh, the remplissage because it, uh, these, the lesion was off track in this case? Sir. It, depend, yeah, it depends on the calculation of the size of your coracoid okay. and on the size of your hill sacs. So you need to do a preoperative uh, so uh, mathematics. Off tracking yeah. by very millimeter. 
uh, very little diameter how you need to measure the size na what is the size of the hill sacks what is the depth of the hill sacks we need to know that and okay. then i think we can proceed and see the amount of glenoid bone loss and then add that coracoid width and then i think that's I think, how to go i think uh, bivek uh, what rajiv just to simplify that we know hmm. that this is off track uh, hill sacks lesion now you calculate the thickness of your coracoid that you are going Absolutely. to put Yes. So you add that thickness of the coracoid to the new glenoid reconstruction. So now your glenoid width plus your thickness of the coracoid that becomes now your glenoid, and right. then take eighty-three percent of that reconstructed, and then again substitute it into your uh, uh, hill sas lesion. If now it falls on track, you don't need to do anything to the hill sas. If it still falls off track, then provided uh, probably you need to do. as sir was saying either rumplissage or a bone graft absolutely absolutely so this hill the tracking diameter of hill sac uh, is almost about 83% of total uh, anterior posterior diameter of the glenoid this has been proven by cadaveric study by eg ito and yamamoto and so what happens is if there is bone loss in anterior inferior glenoid this tracking diameter also decreases because the, the anterior posterior diameter of glenoid has decreased so 83% of decreased diameter is uh, anyhow it is less so what happens while while doing uh, the latarze procedure you are increasing this diameter to uh, some um, higher level so 83% of that new diameter may may lead to off track hill sac becoming the on track hill sac so uh, sometimes what happens is only by doing latarze you can convert off track hill sac into the on track hill sac and you have to calculate that accordingly um, during pre operative um, evaluation so this was what we did uh, rajib sir comments position number of screws screw placement rajib sir i think uh, the position is okay anterior inferior uh -huh. okay and the number of screws is also which is the same your the the uh, the screw that the the superior screw has does it have a bicortical purchase uh, suspicious suspicious so being very very critical okay very uh, critical so, whether, so whether it has bicortical yeah, so it should have a bicortical purchase there and your lower screw is slightly longer i think yes uh, which hardly makes a difference but i think this is a well done lateral check Okay. I would have put the graph slightly more superior, slightly few millimeters. That's it. Okay. Okay. So, what are the complications uh, of the Tarzi? You are. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. 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 Uh, how often you have been doing this glenoid tracking in your patients uh, second thing how do you do technically how to measure it because which how you do the glenoid tracking uh, so that it will be advantage if you can elaborate this technique how you do it to everyone in the all the participants in this group yes sir this uh, glenoid tracking this is just a, just a simple simple ct yes. scan which is available everywhere or you need a certain software to do that can you elaborate to everyone uh, how i did was uh, the drawing on uh, the uh, same simple ct scan but uh, because this is very important topic uh, the concept of glenoid tracking on track off track how to calculate them yeah. and how to make them uh, this this topic has been very nicely covered by professor easy utoy in his talk uh, which is freely available in easy utoy and at the end of this uh, particular case i will be giving that uh, link as well so i think all of uh, us can go into that no, link no i can actually even i i am finding it difficult to understand in that i i have seen those that uh, youtube video of easy utoy but how exactly do you in your, on your your patients in your, with your ct scan This is what I'm I'm trying to ask. Uh, Sudip Dai, Sudip Dai, it's yeah. it's a it's a long uh, you know process that is mm -hmm. done in CT scan and computer, and then yeah. we have to show how it is done. Probably, if you go to our previous Ashwin sessions where we have live demonstrated how we measure the uh, glenoid bone loss and how we use uh, on track and off track. uh probably we'll post that and then uh, i think you raised this question very correctly this is very important of learning this technique speaking yeah. about this is different thing yeah. doing this is a completely different thing exactly so, and this is what i want if to if your, if your yeah. radiologist can do this it's fantastic so off 
of past we have taught our uh, radiologist fortunately they do everything for us so but we is... will definitely post a video bbk camera as soon ko this my video so ni we yes, can sir. post yeah. that to our community you know so that everyone yeah. can see how yes. the live yeah. demonstration got yeah exactly yeah this is what i was trying so this is this is very lengthy technique that's why i wanted to skip this but uh, concisely how i did was this is the unfast view of two glenoid this is the normal glenoid this is abnormal glenoid you make a perfect circle and enter inferred that covers the entry inferred and posterior inferred arc of this glenoid make uh, get the diameter then trace this overlap this uh, this same uh, circle over here and calculate the bone loss this is how we calculate bone loss percentage then we on uh, the, um, the uh, humeral side we outline the humeral head and by uh, calculating the uh, glenoid tract diameter from the previous slide we place this glenoid tract just at the border of the um, the the rotator cuff so the we go medial from that point and the 83% of that uh, we will draw and accordingly we will uh, find out whether this is off track or on track if this hill sack lies over this tracking diameter then it is on track if it lies out of this then it is off track so this is the brief uh, brief thing and we will be posting that video thank you so uh, so can i can i make a brief comment here yes, i think yes, you could sir. simply this is quite lengthy, but basically the glenoid track is the track that the glenoid makes on the humeral head. Yes. The glenoid is a road that it makes on the humerus okay, mm -hmm. when it travels. Okay, So you should think of the hill sacks like a puddle. Okay? Right? Mm -hmm. So let's say if your tire is running, this has been described by Matthew Provencher. So Matthew Provencher says that your zone tire, your, your zone glenoid tire is running on that glenoid track on your humerus. If there's a puddle where your tire track, if it's a very small puddle, the tire track will not fall inside the puddle. Na? Yes, the tire yes. track will just take over the puddle. But if your puddle is very big, then your tire will enter that puddle. So that, that is that engaging hill sacks. This yes, is the yes. best I can... Uh, I've shown that thing in the picture because... Yeah, this is yeah exactly like this, yeah, off track, on track. Yes, so this is okay. Uh, so uh, there are multiple complications that is described with uh, Latarze and uh, uh, the patient came to us after about uh, one and a half years and this was the picture, the full, this was the x-ray. So, Mara, sir, uh, something fishy? Uh, I think what you have to be careful, sometimes the loss of fixation also. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the lower screw is slightly out. I mean, I, I can see the upper one, the lower one it looks like the slightly backed out. So, how will um, you approach now, sir? Hmm? You do some investigation or uh, will course, you do? I mean, uh, what kind of uh, screw that you have put is stainless steel or titanium? Or? Titanium, titanium. Then you can uh, go for better investigations like just to see the condition by the CT scan. Okay. So, this was the picture, sir. And end on, uh, there was only screw, some form of remodeling of that graft. But uh, mm -hmm. I think this is great for resorption. Patient is doing good. Patient has no problem. The no, no dislocation? No, no dislocation. Uh, He's a boxer, started boxing. No problem mm -hmm. at all. But then, uh, uh, this was this and then, CT scan shows this. Then what, what was his complaint? To get he just came for regular follow-up. We did X-ray. Yeah, we yeah. found uh, something wrong with inferior screw. We did CT scan and we found this. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, because in that situation, uh, if as long as the patient's joint is still stable and then uh, he is not bothered about the things, I think keep observing it and then maybe he should be involved with the better physiotherapy programs also. Okay. Be more safe. Okay. And then uh, if he's symptomatic, then we can think of something else. Uh, Rajiv, sir, your approach to this patient. And how common is bone loss in your practice, bone resorption in your oh, practice? Bone, bone resorption is a very difficult problem. <laughs> okay, I mean, you have to do a good lateral day. This is not within your control. You can't do anything. <laughs> now, yes. if this patient came to you without any symptoms... Sir, sir you are muted, sir, please. So, so, what I was saying is bone resorption is a problem. Mm -hmm. This is the problem that the surgeon cannot control mm -hmm. because you've done your surgery well, you've fixed it well. Now, uh, your fixation looks stable. Okay, it looks stable. A bone resorption, if the patient is not symptomatic, I would not do anything to this patient. I would let okay. him continue with uh, whatever activities that he can. 
So my next question is how common is bone resorption in this practice? In your bone resorption, till date, the amount of laterges that I've done, I have not seen any bone resorption. Maybe okay. because I haven't done too many laterges. If you do them in many multiple numbers, maybe you'll see, but I, I haven't found any bone resorption till now. I have found the screw dislodgements after uh, the, uh, the, what, uh, the screws are backed out in some of my cases, in one of my cases, but I have not found any bony resorption till date. Uh, Amit sir, bone resorption, uh, your incidence, and bone, no, you, you identify Vivek bone resorption. You will identify if you do a CT scan. Yes, if you do not do a CT scan, you will not identify. Okay. So, as far as the incidence is concerned, I am not able to tell you this much is incidence. But if you find out some problem with the patient, he had recorded or he had some problem then you definitely investigate uh, in this case you did an x-ray you did a ct scan probably justified i wouldn't have gone for ct scan provided the patient is not having any problem uh, you just manage conservatively because the the bone resorption is not directly proportional to the recurrence of uh, dislocation or your failure of surgery agreed, agreed. again again to reiterate the amount of bone resorption is not proportionate with the failure of your uh, Latarze procedure. Yes. So you are safe. You, you just wait, uh, you watch. It is not only the bone which is acting. There are sling mechanism. There are other mechanism they are acting and probably will help us uh, and he will not have a, a recurrence. If he has recurrence with this one, then we are in problem. Then we have a lot of things to think about. So absolutely, I agree. Uh, the The... The resorption is very common. Literature says that it is very common. Almost about 80 to 90 percent cases there will be resorption, some form of resorption. And what happens is resorption is more towards superior part of the at the level of the superior screw because as the uh, glenoid tracks, as the humerus rotates there will be more stress towards the anterior inferior region. So there will be remodeling. Some even say that this is not actually a bone resorption. This is actually a remodeling because uh, the glenoid wants to go into its original peer shape in uh, the peer shape. So upper part of the bone will be resorbed and lower part won't be resorbed. And finally, there will be good uh, inferior uh, bony, uh, the bony labrum. So if Bo uh, bony glenoid. So if you uh, you uh, look carefully, this is not total resorption. The, uh, the there is slight reformation of the inferior pier shaped glenoid from uh, total vertical split in the um, pre-operative uh, CT scan. So uh, the literature has mentioned four grades of. Uh, Four, three grades actually of the uh, bone loss. Grade one, grade zero is no bone loss at all. Grade one, uh, in which the screw head only is uh, the, the there is a resorption from screw head only. Grade two, along with the screw head, there will be resorption from some of some of the uh, uh, the shaft part. And in grade three, there will be complete uh, bare or naked screw that will be visible out of the glenoid. So what literature says is whatever is uh, the level of bone loss, you, you need not to worry until and unless patient is doing good. Because as Amit sir has already mentioned, there are many other mechanisms by which there will be stable, uh, the, the, this particular technique is providing stability. So if the patient is not symptomatic, uh, uh, the the you not you don't need to do anything because fortunately even with grade three uh, bone resorption patients are doing good patients are doing all type of sports so you not you don't need to worry and you but you have to keep track of them do good follow up of these patients and good follow up of all those uh, screws uh, with uh, CT scan or X rays uh, to intervene whenever there is problem so. So Latarze is um, the technique in which there is three methods, three, uh, three things that play for stability. One is you're adding some bone block uh, for bone defects. Second is you repair the capsule uh, with the coracoacromal ligament with original capsule. Then there is sling effect in which you dissect transversely the subscapularis and put that sling, put that bone block uh, in between them so that uh, while abducting and external rotating, this inferior part of subscap behaves, uh, goes 
um, inferiorly and behaves as a sling, BF as a hammock, just like as IGSL does. So that prevents the uh, re-dislocation or recurrence of dislocation. But uh, there has been controversy about uh, Latazi and ICBG. And there are few papers which says that uh, there is no difference at all between uh, doing ICBG or Elecrest bone graft and Latazi. And uh, internal rotation is slightly decreased in Latarze, and donor side morbidity is the problem of ICBG. So, what is your take on this, Amit sir? We we, we hey, my, my, thought my... That there was three techniques by which Latarze yeah. capability. Now there is concept that there is nothing at all. Uh, but you see, uh, uh, these are uh, so many things coming up. Uh, still, uh, Latarze is the workhorse uh, for those who are not indicated for a uh, bank card repair, uh, ICBG or uh, Eden Hibernate processor that we say ICBG transfer is uh, reserved for very specific cases like uh, uh, epileptic patients, uh, bone loss when they, you need to reconstruct the glenoid, you know. So if there is a more than 35, 45% of the bone loss, uh, your coracoid thickness is limited. So you cannot increase the size of, size of the glenoid. So if you want to reconstruct the glenoid, especially if there is a bone loss of more than 35%, more than 30%, probably in those cases, I'll go ahead with the Eden Hibernate procedure. Otherwise, um, majority of my cases is, uh, uh, you know, Latarze and the bank card. So only two indications at this moment, more than 30% bone loss and epileptic patient, ICBG transfer. In rest of the others, it's Latarze and the bank card. Uh, Mara, sir, your comments. Uh, I think the Amit says exactly. I mean, there's nothing much to talk because if most important thing is that how much bone loss is more important. If a severe bone loss, like uh, you know, we are talk talking about Latarze and 25 percent or slightly more than 25 percent, something like that. But if the severe bone loss more than 40 percent or glenoid, then I think some sort of uh, uh, more thick bone block procedure is important, just like uh, Amit said. I think that, uh, there's nothing much, to, not much of experience from our side in all these complications and all these kind of things. But anyway, that is the routine procedure that we have been doing. Okay, uh, absolutely. So, uh, ICBG. Wait, now, one more. Wait, yes, one more. One yes, more. I think. I think. Uh, yeah, like you showed in this picture. Oh, I, I don't know here. Basically, I see G, I, I, this uh, iliac crest bone graft and latter J, they have their own indications, right? Okay. But I would like to add one more indication for ICBG, that is a failed latter J. Uh -huh. So that also could be, I think, one of the indications. That's it. Yes, yes. So, okay. So uh, the, can we can we summarize that um, for good bone loss, um, the more than 25% bone loss, still the treatment of choice is work house is the latter J. And in some cases, in some particular cases, uh, we can do ICBG, but the literature is now uprising about the benefits of ICBG over uh, the uh, glenoid, at least not over, maybe equal to uh, the, the results are equal with both, both the procedures. So uh, only time will say if the, these letters go away uh, with ICBG, but uh, now at, at least for uh, today, um, at least for uh, now, Latarze is the workers. Okay. I think, <laughs> I think Vivek Latarze is trying to push off bank art repairs, you know. <laughs> so yes, Latarze is going to stay for very, very long. Lata the people who follow Latarze, they say that uh, doing a bank art repair, arthroscopic bank art repair is rubbish, you know. For yes. every, either there is a bone loss, there is no bone yeah. loss, yes. either the patient is whatever. So yeah. uh, I think um, this is controversial, but yes, things sir. are evolving. No, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, things will evolve and we'll come to know and uh, according the only permanent thing is change you know in this world so we, we yes. should keep on changing i think absolutely the thing is what 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 i could uh, think from one of the papers that i read was basically bank card is an american thing yes, okay? yes that's one yes. of the papers i mentioned this yes and uh, this uh, this latter j is an european thing which has been advocated by the french yes okay so the people yeah. from Fran uh, europe mostly do latter j and the people from america mostly do bank card so it's somewhat other area. So they have their own favorites and likes. Why but not we have some Asian things, you know? <laughs> Asian, Asian thing is do a bit of both, you know? That is Asian. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the summary of these two cases are the treatment paradigm. Treatment paradigm, if uh, by calculation there is glenoid bone loss is less than 25%, and if hill sac is contract, do bank card repair, as in our first case. Um, 
sorry, at, as um, not in our first case, first case was second was less than 25% boneless off track, bank card repair plus remplaces. Had that hill sack been on track, we would have been uh, happy with bank card repair only. So boneless if more than 20, uh, more than 25% and if it is on track, do latarze. If it is off track, do latarze plus remplaces. But keep in mind, by doing latarze, you are increasing the tracking diameter and if that even by increasing that tracking diameter, if it comes again off track, then only do one place. Otherwise, only letter Z can uh, cover up some of the off track uh, hill sack lesion and convert them to on track lesions. So this is what uh, Rajiv sir was mentioning, uh, the comparison of uh, on track and off track hill sack lesion with tires of the, uh, uh, the, the zip. And this is the link which I was uh, uh, talking about. A uh, famous professor is Toy from Japan who gave this concept of uh, the glenoid track. Uh, and this is his popular talk, very um, uh, freely available in YouTube. You just have to search Professor E.G. Itoy, Solar Instability. And you, this is, this is, I think, a 19 minutes talk. And you will, you will learn everything. You will understand everything. This is very simple. He has mentioned all things, very, very simple thing. So I have few more cases. Uh, the time is already 11.27. I think we have to stop. Uh, what do you say, sir? Let us stop, Vivek. Let us stop, up, Vivek. Yes. Let, yeah. let us stop yes. and wrap up. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, my esteemed panelists. Thank you so much, all of the participants. Uh, I think there are some questions in chat box. Uh, I think uh, we can take some of them and wrap up. Dr. Krishna? Yes, um, I will narrate the questions. Um, one question is from Novin Tribadi. In case of graph resorption of remodeling, is there any discontinuity of the conjoint in attachment? Sling effect is compromised. That's the question from him. Mm, the answer is don't know. I, the we we didn't do MRI. We just did uh, the uh, the CT scan. Uh, but I think uh, the inferior Vivek, part of Vivek, one, yes, Vivek, yes. What what we have to understand is this is graft resorption. This is not graft detachment. Detachment and resorptions are completely different. Resorption means the the anterior part of the graft is resolved and it has healed some portion even a flake is healed so your sling effect will remain uh, for that is the reason why recurrent so if I it is a graft detachment then it is completely different i also think so because as i've already mentioned the remote it is more of a remote link than resorption and inferior part of some part of inferior part inferior bone has developed there so uh, the conjoint mm -hmm. tendon must have attached there, and if and uh, we also know that even the soft tissue, if we uh, by various procedures in uh, in hand, if we just detach any soft soft tissue and leave it as such, if we go after two to three weeks, it gets its one attachment. So I think uh, it's not fair to say that after about one and a half years, the glenoid uh, the conjoint tendon will be able because it will be attached to some some soft tissue with good strong attachment. Okay. Also, also, if you if you understand the grading of graft resorption, it actually starts from superior and underneath yes. the screw, and then it goes literally deeper and deeper, and then it does not completely resolve. Some flake of uh, this is uh, uh, preserved. Okay, Dr. Krishna, next question, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, next question is from uh, Dr. Novin Gon. Uh, he has asked the question: What is your sequence of repair? You finish rims plus, then go for bank cut or vice versa. So I, I'll ask this question to Rajiv sir. First so rim plus, then uh, yes. Yeah, you, you do, yeah, so you do a rim plus, put your anchor there, leave it there, do your bank cut, tie your rim plus anchor later. Okay, Mara sir. Same. Okay, Sudip sir. Same, same procedure. Amit sir, same. True, true, correct. Okay, so next question. Dr. Krishna, next question, please. Sorry, sorry, there are no further questions that is shown in my chat box. Okay, <laughs> so, so I think we have very vibrant discussion, uh, very good discussion. So, so thank you so much. Thank you all my esteemed panelists. Thank you all participants. Participants, we we almost reached almost about ninety participants today, and at the end of two and a half hours, we still have fifty two participants. So that means we the program was very successful. Thank you so much. Uh, all to you, Sunil.
Yeah, thank you, Vivek, for uh, conducting such a nice panel discussion session. And I would like to thank Eson and uh, all other participants and the esteemed panelists for uh, giving a good uh, knowledge on the solar instability to all of us. And I think the coming day program of the Eson will further enlighten the uh, other pathologies in the shoulder. And uh, finally, I'd like to request the scientific committee chief, uh, Dr. Sailaj, to have his some word on it. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, we've come up to nearly afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, I must really thank TUTH team to help in. And Vivek has been very instrumental. Uh, I thank Dr. Mara, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Sudeep to help out in such a interesting topic. Uh, and uh, hopefully um, the next topic is going to be on rotator cuff and uh, we'll be having another fantastic discussion at that time. That will be from BNB Hospital and we'll be seeing the uh, same group of people uh, and there'll be a lot to learn from them. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks for every, everyone coming in here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thanks, Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv is somewhere around here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, Ishwar sir is around. Ishwar sir. Uh, Ishwar Ishwar is there? I think he's there. Ishwar sir. Okay, I'm around, but uh, as already everything has been said, thank you for all of you. You know, it was a very interesting talk, you know, you covered everything and we had a massive participation that is good. And I don't think I need to say anything more. It has been done very well by my scientific committee. Thanks to the TUTS group and to the expert panelists. Thank you. Have a good Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. You. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.